Introduction to Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. A selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Songling, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, Volume One. Introduction by Herbert Allen Giles. Read by J. C. Guan. The very skeleton of a biography is all that can be formed from the very scanty materials which remain to mark the career of a writer whose work has been, for the best part of two centuries, as familiar throughout the land and breadth of China as are the tales of the Arabian Nights in all English-speaking communities. The author of Strange Stories was a native of Zituan, in the province of Shandong. His family name was Pu, his particular name was Song Ling, and the designation or literary epithet by which, in accordance with Chinese usage, he was commonly known among his friends, was Liu Xian, or Last of the Immortals. A further fancy name given to him probably by some enthusiastic admirer was Liu Quan, or Willow Spring, but he is now familiarly spoken of simply as Pu Song Ling. We are unacquainted with the years of his birth or death. However, by the aid of a meager entry in the history of Zituan, it is possible to make a pretty good guess at the date of the former event, for we are there told that Pu Song Ling successfully competed for the lowest or bachelor's degree before he had reached the age of twenty, and that in 1651, he was in the position of a graduate of ten years' standing, having failed in the interim to take the second, or master's degree. To this failure, due, as we are informed in the history above quoted, to his neglect of the beaten track of academic study, we owe the existence of his great work, not indeed his only production, though the one by which, as Confucius said, of his own spring and autumn, footnote, the annals of loose date, and footnote, men will know him. All else that we have on record of Pu Song Ling, besides the fact that he lived in close companionship with several eminent scholars of the day, is gathered from his own words, written when, in 1679, he laid down his pen upon the completion of a task which was to raise him within a short period to a foremost rank in the Chinese world of letters. Of that record, I here append a close translation, accompanied by such notes as are absolutely necessary to make it intelligible to non-students of Chinese. Author's Own Record Clad in wisteria, girdled with ivy. Footnote, said of the bogies of the hills, in allusion to their clothes, here quoted with reference to the official classes, in ridicule of the title under which they hold posts which, from a literary point of view, they are totally unfit to occupy. And footnote. Clad in wisteria, girdled with ivy, thus sank Chu Ping in his falling into trouble. Footnote. Chu Ping was a celebrated statesman, B.C. 332-295, to who, having lost his master's favor by the intrigues of a rival, finally drowned himself in despair. The annual dragon festival is said by some to be a search for his body. The term San Lu used here was the name of an office held by Chu Ping. Falling into trouble was a poem addressed by Chu Ping to his prince after his disgrace. Its non-success was the immediate cause of his death. And footnote. Of ox-headed devils and serpent gods. Footnote. That is, of the supernatural generally. And footnote. He of the long nails. Footnote. A poet of the Tang dynasty whose eyebrows met, whose nails were very long, and who could write very fast. And footnote. Never wearied to tell. Each interprets in his own way the music of heaven. Footnote. You know the music of earth, said Zhuang Zhu. But you have not heard the music of heaven. And footnote. And whether it be discord or not, depends upon antecedent causes. Footnote. That is, to the operation of some influence surviving from a previous existence. And footnote. As for me, I cannot, with my poor autumn firefly's light, match myself against the half-goblins of the age. Footnote. This is another hit at the rolling classes. Si Kang, a celebrated musician and alchemist, A.D. 223-262, to 262, 
was sitting one night alone playing upon his lute when suddenly a man with a tiny face walked in and began to stare hard at him the stranger's face enlarging all the time i'm not going to match myself against the devil cried the musician after a few moments and instantly blew out the light and footnote i am but the dust in the sunbeam a fit laughing stock for devils footnote when liu chuan governor of wuling determined to relieve his poverty by trade he saw a devil standing by his side, laughing and rubbing its hands for glee. Poverty and wealth are matters of destiny, said Liu Chuan, but to be laughed at by a devil, and accordingly he desisted from his intention. End footnote. For my talents are not those of Gan Bao. Footnote. A writer who flourished in the early part of the fourth century, and composed a work of thirty books entitled Supernatural Researches. End footnote. For my talents are not those of Gan Bao elegant explorer of the records of the gods. I am rather animated by the spirit of Su Dong Po, who loved to hear men speak of the supernatural. Footnote. Su Dong Po was the famous poet, statesman, and essayist, who flourished A.D. 1036 to 1101. End footnote. I get people to commit what they tell me to writing, and subsequently I dress it up in the form of a story, and thus in the lapse of time my friends from all quarters have supplied me with quantities of material, which, from my habit of collecting, has grown to a vast pile. Footnote. Quote, and his friends had the habit of jotting down for his unfailing delight anything quaint or comic that they came across. End quote. The World on Charles Dickens, July 24, 1878. End footnote. Human beings, I would point out, are not beyond the pale of fixed laws, and yet there are more remarkable phenomena in their midst than in the country of those who cropped their hair. Footnote. It is related in the historical record that when Tai Po and Yu Chong fled to the southern savages, they saw men with tattooed bodies and short hair. End footnote. Antiquity is unrolled before us, and many tales are to be found therein stranger than that of the nation of flying heads. Footnote a fabulous community, so-called, because the heads of men are in the habit of leaving their bodies, and flying down to marshy places to feed on worms and crabs. A red ring is seen the night before the flight, encircling the neck of the man whose head is about to fly. At daylight the head returns. Some say that the ears are used as wings, others that the hands also leave the body and fly away. End footnote. Quote, Irrepressible burst and luxurious ease. End quote. Footnote. A quotation from the admired works of Wang Po, a brilliant scholar and poet, who was drowned at the early age of twenty-eight, A.D. 676, and footnote. Such was always his enthusiastic strain, quote, for ever indulging in liberal thought, end quote. Footnote. I have hitherto failed in all attempts to identify the particular writer here intended. The phrase is used by the poet Li Tai Po and others. End footnote. Thus, he spoke openly without restraint. Were men like these to open my book, I should be a laughing stock to them indeed. At the crossroad, footnote, the crossroad of the five fathers is here mentioned, which the commentator tells us is merely the name of the place. End footnote. At the crossroad, men will not listen to me. And yet, I have some knowledge of the three states of existence spoken of beneath the cliff. Footnote. The past, present, and future life of the Buddhist system of metempsychosis, a certain man who was staying at the temple dreamt that an old priest appeared to him beneath a jade stone cliff, and, pointing to a stick of burning incense, said to him, That incense represents a vow to be fulfilled. But I say unto you, that ere its smoke shall have curled away, your three states of existence will have been already accomplished. The meaning is that time on earth is as nothing to the gods. End footnote. Neither should the words I utter be set aside because of him that utters them. Footnote. This remark occurs in the fifteenth chapter of the Analects or Confucian Gospels. End footnote. When the bow was hung at my father's door. Footnote. The birth of a boy was formally signaled by hanging a bow at the door, that of a girl by displaying a small towel, indicative of the parts that each would hereafter play in the drama of life. End footnote. When the bow was hung at my father's door, he dreamt that the sickly-looking Buddhist priest, but half covered by his stole, entered the chamber. On one of his breasts was a round piece of plaster like a cache, and my father, 
walking from sleep, found that I, just born, had a similar black patch on my body. As a child, I was thin and constantly ailing, and unable to hold my own in the battle of life. Our own home was chill and desolate as a monastery, and working there for my livelihood with my pen, footnote, literally, ploughing with my pen, and footnote, I was as poor as a priest with his alms bowl, footnote, the patra or bowl used by Buddhist mendicants in imitation of the celebrated alms dish of Shakyamuni Buddha, and footnote, often and often I put my hand to my head, footnote, literally scratched my head, as is often done by the Chinese in perplexity or doubt, and footnote. Often and often I put my hand to my head, and exclaimed, Surely he who sat with his face to the wall, footnote, alluding to Bodhidharma, who came from India to China, and tried to convert the Emperor Wu Di of the Liang dynasty, but failing in his attempt, because he insisted that real merit lay not in works, but in purity and wisdom combined, he retired full of mortification to a temple at Songsan, where he sat for nine years before a rock, until his own image was imprinted thereon. And footnote. Surely, he who sat with his face to the wall was myself in previous state of existence. And thus, I referred to my non-success in this life, to the influence of a destiny surviving from the last. I have been tossed hither and thither in the direction of the rolling wind, like a flower falling in filthy places. But the six paths of transmigration are inscrutable indeed, and I have no right to complain. Footnote. The six paths of transmigration are the six gati, or conditions of existence, namely angels, men, demons, hungry devils, brute beasts, and tortured sinners. End footnote. As it is, midnight finds me with an expiring lamp, while the wind whistles mournfully without. Quote, and over my cheerless table I piece together my tales. Footnote literally pulling together the pieces under the forelegs of foxes to make robes. This part of the foxskin is the most valuable for making fur clothes. End footnote. Vainly hoping to produce a sequel to the infernal regions. Footnote. The work of a well-known writer named Ling Yiqing, who flourished during the Song Dynasty. End footnote. With a bumper, I stimulate my pen. Yet, I only succeed thereby in, quote, venting my excited feelings. End quote. Footnote. Alluding to an essay by Han Fei, a philosopher of the third century, in which he laments the iniquity of the age in general, and the corruption of officials in particular, he finally committed suicide in prison, where he had been cast by the intrigues of a rival minister. End footnote. And as I thus commit my thoughts to writing, truly I am an object worthy of commiseration. Alas! I am but a bird, that, dreading the winter frost, finds no shelter in the tree, the autumn insect that chirps to the moon and hugs the door for warmth. For where are they who know me? Footnote. Confucius, Analects 14, said, quote, Alas, there is no one who knows me to be what I am. End quote. End footnote. They are, quote, in the bosky grove and at the frontier pass, End quote. wrapped in an impenetrable gloom. Footnote. The great poet Du Fu, A.D. 712-770, dreamt that his greater predecessor, Li Taipo, A.D. 705-762, appeared to him, quote, coming when the maple grove was in darkness, and returning while the frontier pass was still obscured, end quote, that is, at night, when no one could see him, the meaning being that he never came at all, and that those, quote, who know me, Pu Song Ling, end quote, are equally non-existent, end footnote. From the above curious document, the reader will gain some insight into the abstruse, but at the same time marvelously beautiful, style of this gifted writer. The whole essay, for such it is, and among the most perfect of his kind, is intended chiefly as a satire upon the scholarship of the age, scholarship which had turned the author back to the disappointment of a private life, himself conscious all the time of the inward fire that had been lent him by heaven, it is the keynote of his own subsequent career, spent in the retirement of home, in the society of books and friends, as also to the numerous uncomplimentary allusions which occur in all his stories relating to official life. 
whether or not the world at large has been a gainer by this instance of the fallibility of competitive examinations has been already decided in the affirmative by the millions of Pu Songling's own countrymen, who, for the past two hundred years, have more than made up to him by a posthumous and enduring reverence for the loss of those earthly and ephemeral honors which he seems to have coveted so much. Strange stories from a Chinese studio, known to the Chinese as the Liao Zai Zhi Yi, or more familiarly the Liao Zai, has hardly been mentioned by a single foreigner without some inaccuracy on the part of the writer concerned. For instance, the late Mr. Mayers states in his Chinese Reader's Manual, page 176, that his work was composed, quote, circa A.D. 1710, end quote. The fact being that the collection was actually completed in 1679, as we know by the date attached to the author's own record given above. I should mention, however, that the Liao Tai was originally, and for many years, circulated in manuscript only. Pu Songling, as we are told in a colophon by his great-grandson to the first edition, was too poor to meet the heavy expense of block-cutting, and it was not until so late as 1740, when the author must have been already for some time a denizen of the dark land he so much loved to describe, that his aforesaid grandson printed and published the collection now universally famous. Since then, many editions have been laid before the Chinese public, the best of which is that by Tan Minglun, a salt commissioner, who flourished during the reign of Tao Guang, and who, in 1842, produced, at his own expense, an excellent edition in sixteen small octavo volumes of about a hundred and sixty pages each. And as various editions will occasionally be found to contain various readings, I would here warn students of Chinese, who wish to compare my renderings with the text, that it is from the edition of Tan Minglun, collated with that of Yu Chi, published in 1766, that this translation has been made. Many have been the commentaries and disquisitions upon the meaning of obscure passages and the general scope of this work, to say nothing of the prefaces with which the several editions have been ushered into the world. Of the latter, I have selected one specimen from which the reader will be able to form a tolerably accurate opinion as to the true nature of these always singular and usually difficult compositions. Here it is, Tang Meng Lai's preface. The common saying, he regards a camel as a horse with a swelled back, trivial of itself, may be used in illustration of greater matters. Men are wont to attribute an existence only to such things as they daily see with their own eyes, and they marvel at whatsoever, appearing before them at one instant, vanishes at the next. And yet, it is not at the sprouting and failing of foliage, nor at the metamorphosis of insects, that they marvel, but only at the manifestations of the supernatural world. Though of a truth, the whistling of the wind and the movement of streams, with nothing to set the one in motion, or give sound to the other, might well be ranked among extraordinary phenomena. We are accustomed to these, and therefore do not note them. We marvel at devils and foxes, we do not marvel at man. But who is it that causes a man to move and speak? To which question comes the ready answer of each individual so questioned. I do. This I do, however, is merely a personal consciousness, of the facts under discussion. For a man can see with his eyes, but he cannot see what it is that makes him see. He can hear with his ears, but he cannot hear what it is that makes him hear. How then is it possible for him to understand the rationale of things he can neither see nor hear? Whatever has come within the bounds of their own ocular or auricular experience, men regard as proved to be actually existing, and only such things. Footnote. Quote, Thus, since countless things exist that the senses can take account of, it is evident that nothing exists that the senses cannot take account of. End quote. The professor in W. H. Malik's New Paul in Virginia. This passage recalls another curious classification by the great Chinese philosopher Han Wenkun, 
Quote, there are some things which possess form but are devoid of sound, as, for instance, jade and stones. Others have sound but are without form, such as wind and thunder. Others, again, have both form and sound, such as men and animals. And lastly, there is a class devoid of both, namely devils and spirits. End footnote. But this term experience may be understood in various senses. For instance, people speak of something which has certain attributes as form, and of something else which has certain other attributes as substance. Ignorant as they are, that form and substance are to be found existing without those particular attributes. Things which are thus constituted are inappreciable, indeed, by our ears and eyes, but we cannot argue that therefore they do not exist. Some persons can see a mosquito's eye, while to others even a mountain is invisible. Others can hear the sound of ants battling together, while others again fail to catch the roar of a thunder peal. Powers of seeing and hearing vary. There should be no reckless imputations of blindness. According to the schoolmen, man at his death is dispersed like wind or fire. The origin and end of his vitality being alike unknown, and as those who have seen strange phenomena are few, the number of those who marvel at them is proportionately great, and the, quote, horse with a swelled back, end quote, parallel, is very widely applicable. And ever quoting the fact that Confucius would have nothing to say on these topics, the schoolmen have discredited such works as the Qi Jie Zi Guai and the Yu Chu Ji. Footnote I have never seen any of these works, but I believe they treat, as implied by their titles, chiefly of the supernatural world. End footnote. Ignorant that the sages' unwillingness to speak had reference only to persons of an inferior mental caliber. For his own spring and autumn can hardly be said to be devoid of all illusions of the kind. Now, Pu Liu Xian devoted himself in his youth to the marvelous, and as he grew older, was specially remarkable for his comprehension thereof, and being moreover a most elegant writer, he occupied his leisure in recording whatever came to his knowledge of a particularly marvellous nature. A volume of these compositions of his formerly fell into my hands, and was constantly borrowed by friends. Now I have another volume, and of what I read only about three-tenths was known to me before. What there is should be sufficient to open the eyes of those schoolmen, though I much fear it will be like talking of ice to a butterfly. Personally, I disbelieve in the irregularity of natural phenomena, and regard as evil spirits only those who injure their neighbors. For eclipses, falling stars, the flight of herons, the nest of a mina, talking stones, and the combats of dragons, can hardly be classed as irregular, while the phenomena of nature occurring out of season, wars, rebellions, and so forth, may certainly be relegated to the category of evil. In my opinion, the morality of Pu Liu Xian's work is of a very high standard, its objective being distinctly to glorify virtue and to censure vice, and as a book calculated to elevate mankind, it may be safely placed side by side with the philosophical treatises of Yang Xiong, Note BC 53 to AD 18, which Huan Tan, Note BC 13 to AD 56, declared to be so worthy of a wide circulation. With regard to the meaning of the Chinese words Liao Zai Zhi Yi, this title has received indifferent treatment at the hands of different writers. Dr. Williams chose to render it by Pastimes of the Study, and Mr. Mayers by The Record of Marvels, or Tales of the Genii, neither of which is sufficiently near to be regarded in the light of a translation. Taken literally and in order, these words stand for Liao, Library, Record, Strange, Liao being simply a fanciful name given by our author to his private library or studio. An apocryphal anecdote traces the origin of this selection to a remark once made by himself with reference to his failure for the second degree. Alas, he is reported to have said, I shall now have no resource, Liao, for my old age. And accordingly, he so named his study, meaning that in his pen he would seek that resource which fate had denied to him as an official. 
For this untranslatable Liao, I have ventured to substitute Chinese, as indicating more clearly the nature of what is to follow. No such titles as Tales of the Genii fully expresses the scope of this work, which embraces alike weird stories of Taoist devilry and magic, marvelous accounts of impossible countries beyond the sea, simple scenes of Chinese everyday life, and notices of extraordinary natural phenomena. Indeed, the author once had it in contemplation to publish only the more imaginative of the tales in the present collection under the title of Devil and Fox Stories, but from this scheme he was ultimately dissuaded by his friends, the result being the heterogeneous mass which is more aptly described by the title I have given to this volume. In a similar matter, I too had originally determined to publish a full and complete translation of the whole of these sixteen volumes, but on a closer acquaintance many of the stories turned out to be quite unsuitable for the age in which we live, forcibly recalling the coarseness of our own writers of fiction in the eighteenth century. Others again were utterly pointless, or mere repetitions in a slightly altered form. From the whole, I therefore selected one hundred and sixty-four of the best and most characteristic stories, of which eight had previously been published by Mr. Allen in the China Review, and one by Mr. Mayers in Notes and Queries on China and Japan, two by myself in the columns of the Celestial Empire, and four by Dr. Williams in a now-forgotten handbook of Chinese. The remaining one hundred and forty-nine have never before, to my knowledge, been translated into English. To those, however, who can enjoy the Liao Zai in the original text, the distinctions between the various stories in felicity of plot, originality, and so on, are far less sharply defined. So impressed as each competent reader must be by the incomparable style in which even the meanest is arrayed. For in this respect, as important now in Chinese eyes as it was with ourselves in days not long gone by, the author of the Liao Zai and the rejected candidate succeeded in founding a school of his own, in which he has since been followed by hosts of servile imitators, with more or less success. Terseness is pushed to extreme limits. Each particle that can be safely dispensed with is scrupulously eliminated, and every here and there some new and original combination invests perhaps a single word with a force it could never have possessed, except under the hands of a perfect master of his art. Add to the above copious allusions and adaptations from a course of reading, which would seem to have been coextensive with the whole range of Chinese literature, a wealth of metaphor and an artistic use of figures generally to which only the writings of Carlyle form an adequate parallel, and the result is a work which, for purity and beauty of style, is now universally accepted in China as the best and most perfect model. Sometimes the story runs along plainly and smoothly enough, but the next moment we may be plunged into pages of abstruse text, the meaning of which is so involved in quotations from and allusions to the poetry or history of the past three thousand years as to be recoverable only after diligent perusal of the commentary and much searching in other works of reference. In illustration of the popularity of this book, Mr. Mayers once stated that, quote, the porter at his gate, the boatman at his midday rest, the chair coolie at his stand, no less than the man of letters among his books, may be seen poring with delight over the elegantly narrated marvels of the Liao Tsai. Quote. But he would doubtless have withdrawn this statement in later years, with the work lying open before him. During many years in China, I made a point of never, when feasible, passing by a reading Chinese, without asking permission to glance at the volume in his hand, and at my various stations in China, I always kept up a borrowing acquaintance with the libraries of my private or official servants. But I can safely affirm that I never once detected the Liao Tsai in the hands of an ill-educated man. In the same connection, Mr. Mayers observed that fairy tales told in the style of the anatomy of melancholy 
would scarcely be a popular book in Great Britain. But except in some particular points of contact, the styles of these two works could scarcely claim even the most distant of relationships. Such, then, is the setting of this collection of strange stories from a Chinese studio, many of which contain, in addition to the advantages of style and plot, a very excellent moral. The intention of most of them is, in the actual words of Tang Meng Lai, quote, to glorify virtue and to censure vice, end quote. Always, it must be borne in mind, according to the Chinese and not the European interpretation of these terms, as an addition to our knowledge of the folklore of China, and as a guide to the manners, customs, and social life of that vast empire, my translation of the Liao Tai may not be wholly devoid of interest. It has now been carefully revised, all inaccuracies of the first edition having been, so far as possible, corrected. Herbert A. Giles, Cambridge, July 1908 End of the Introduction Part 1 of A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling Translated by Herbert Allen Giles Volume 1, Part 1 Examination for the Post of Guardian Angel My eldest sister's husband's grandfather, named Song Tao, was a graduate, one day, while lying down from indisposition, an official messenger arrived, bringing the usual notification in his hand, and leading a horse with a white forehead, to summon him to the examination for his master's degree. Mr. Song here remarked that the grand examiner had not yet come, and asked why there should be this hurry. The messenger did not reply to this, but pressed so earnestly that at length Mr. Song roused himself and getting upon the horse, rode with him. The way seemed strange, and by and by they reached a city which resembled the capital of a prince. They then entered the prefect's yamen, the apartments of which were beautifully decorated, and there they found some ten officials sitting at the upper end, all strangers to Mr. Sung, with the exception of one whom he recognized to be the god of war. In the veranda were two tables and two stalls, and at the end of one of the former a candidate was already seated, so Mr. Sung sat down alongside of him. On the table were writing materials for each, and suddenly down flew a piece of paper with a theme on it, consisting of the following eight words, One man, two men, by intention, without intention. When Mr. Sung had finished his essay, he took it into the hall. It contained the following passage. Those who are virtuous by intention, though virtuous, shall not be rewarded. Those who are wicked without intention, though wicked, shall receive no punishment. The presiding deities praised this sentiment very much, and calling Mr. Sung to come forward, said to him, a guardian angel is wanted in Hernan. Go you, and take up the appointment. Mr. Sung no sooner heard this than he bowed his head and wept, saying, Unworthy though I am of the honour you have conferred upon me, I should not venture to decline it, but that my aged mother has reached her seventh decade, and there is no one now to take care of her. I pray you let me wait until she has fulfilled her destiny, when I will hold myself at your disposal. Thereupon one of the deities, who seemed to be the chief, gave instructions to search out his mother's term of life, and a long-bearded attendant forthwith brought in the Book of Fate. On turning it over, he declared that she still had nine years to live, 
and then a consultation was held among the deities, in the middle of which the god of war said, Very well, let Mr. Graduate Zhang take the post, and be relieved in nine years' time. Then, turning to Mr. Sung, he continued, You ought to proceed without delay to your post, but as a reward for your filial piety you are granted a furlough of nine years. At the expiration of that time you will receive another summons. He next addressed a few kind words to Mr. Zhang, and the two candidates, having made their kowtow, went away together. Grasping Mr. Sung's hand, his companion, who gave Zhang Qi of Changshan as his name and address, accompanied him beyond the city walls, and gave him a stanza of poetry at parting. I cannot recall it all, but in it occurred this couplet. With wine and flowers we chase the hours in one eternal spring. No moon, no light to cheer the night, thyself that ray must bring. Mr. Sung here left him and rode on, and before very long reached his own home. Here he awakened as if from a dream, and found that he had been dead three days, when his mother, hearing a groan in the coffin, ran to it and helped him out. It was some time before he could speak, and then he at once inquired about Changshan, where, as it turned out, a graduate named Zhang had died that very day. Nine years afterwards, Mr. Song's mother, in accordance with fate, passed from this life. And when the funeral obsequies were over, her son, having first purified himself, entered into his chamber and died also. Now his wife's family lived within the city, near the western gate, and all of a sudden they beheld Mr. Sung, accompanied by numerous chariots and horses with carved trappings and red-tasseled bits, enter into the hall, make an obeisance, and depart. They were very much disconcerted at this, not knowing that he had become a spirit, and rushed out into the village to make inquiries, when they heard he was already dead. Mr. Sung had an account of his adventure written by himself, but, unfortunately, after the insurrection, it was not to be found. This is only an outline of the story. Footnotes Number 1. Guardian Angel, the tutelar deity of every Chinese city. 2. Sung Tao was a graduate, that is, he had taken the first or bachelor's degree, I shall not hesitate to use strictly English equivalents for all kinds of Chinese terms. The three degrees are literally cultivated talent, raised man, and promoted scholar. 3. The Prefect Yaman, the official residence of a Mandarin above a certain rank. 4. The God of War, the Chinese Mars, a celebrated warrior named Guan Yu, who lived about the beginning of the third century of our era. He was raised after death to the rank of a god, and now plays a leading part in the Chinese pantheon. 5. He awakened as if from a dream, and found that he had been dead three days. Catalepsy, which is the explanation of many a story in this collection, would appear to be of very common occurrence among the Chinese. Such, however, is not the case. End of Examination for the Post of Guardian Angel Part 2 of a selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Songling, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, Volume 1, Part 2. The Talking Pupils Read by Ashwin Jen At Chang'an there lived a scholar named Fang Tung, who, though by no means destitute of ability, was a very unprincipled rake, and in the habit of following and speaking to any woman he might chance to meet. 
the day before the spring festival of clear weather, he was strolling about outside the city when he saw a small carriage with red curtains and an embroidering awning, followed by a crowd of waiting maids on horseback, one of whom was exceedingly pretty and riding on a small palfrey. Going closer to get a better view, Mr. Chang noticed that the carriage curtain was partly open and inside he beheld a beautifully dressed girl of about sixteen, lovely beyond anything he had ever seen. Dazzled by the sight, he could not take his eyes off her, and now before, now behind, he followed the carriage for many a mile. By and by he heard the young lady call out to her maid, and when the latter came alongside, said to her, let down the screen for me, who is this rude fellow that keeps on staring so? The maid accordingly laid down the screen, and looking angrily at Mr. Fang, said to him, This is the bride of the seventh prince in the city of immortals, going home to see her parents, and no village girl that he should stare at her thus. Then taking a handful of dust, she threw at him and blinded him. He rubbed his eyes and looked around but the carriage and the horses were gone. This frightened him, and he went off home, feeling very uncomfortable about the eyes. He sent for a doctor to examine his eyes, and on the pupils were found a small film, which had increased by next morning. The eyes were watering incessantly all the time. The film went on growing, and in a few days was as thick as a cash. On the right pupil there came a kind of spiral, and as no medicine was of any avail, the sufferer gave himself up to grief and wished for death. He then thought he might repent of his misdeeds, and hearing that the Kwang Ming Sutra could relieve misery, he got a copy and hired a man to teach it to him. At first it was a very tedious task, but by degrees he became more composed and spent the whole day in posture of devotion, telling his beads. At the end of a year he had arrived at a state of perfect calm, when one day he heard a small voice, about as loud as a fly's, calling out from his left eye, It's horrid dark in here. To this he heard a reply from the right eye, saying, Let us go out for a stroll, and cheer ourselves up a bit. Then he felt a wriggling in his nose, which made it itch, just as if something was going out of reach of the nostrils, and after a while he felt it again, as if going the other way. Afterwards he heard a voice from one eye say, I hadn't seen the garden for a long time. The epidendrums are all withered and dead. Now Mr. Fang was very fond of these epidendrums, of which he had planted a great number, and had been accustomed to water them himself, but since the loss of his sight he had never even alluded to them. Hearing, however, these words, he at once asked his wife why she had left the epidendrums die. She inquired how he knew they were dead, and when he told her that she went out to sea and found them actually withered away. They were both very much astonished at this, and his wife proceeded to conceal herself in the room. She then observed two tiny people, no bigger than a bean, come down from her husband's nose and run out of the door, where she lost sight of them. In a little while they came back and flew up to his face, like bees or beetles seeking their nests. This went on for some days, until Mr. Fang heard from the left eye. This roundabout road is not at all convenient. It would be as well for us to make a door. To this the right eye answered. My wall is too thick. It wouldn't be at all an easy job. I will try and open mine, said the left eye. And then it will do for both of us. Whereupon Mr. Fang felt a pain in his left eye as something was being split and in a moment he found that he could see the tables and chairs in the room. He was delighted at this and told his wife, who examined his eye and discovered an opening in the film, through which he could see the 
black pupil shining out beneath, the eyeball itself looking like a cracked pepper corn. By next morning, the film had disappeared, and when his eyes was closely examined, it was observed to contain two pupils. The spiral on the right eye remained as before, and then they knew that the two pupils had taken up their abode in one eye. Further, although Mr. Fangs was still blind of one eye, the sight of the other was better than that of the two together. From this time, he was more careful of his behavior and acquired in his part of the country the reputation of a virtuous man. Footnotes 1. The Spring Festival of Clear Weather One of the 24 solar terms, it falls on or about the 5th of April and is the special time for worshipping at the family tombs. 2. A Cash the common European name for the only Chinese coin, about 20 of which go to a penny. Each has a square hole in the middle for the convenience of stringing them together, hence the expression strings of cash. 3. The belief that the human eye contains a tiny being of the human shape is universal in China. It originated, of course, from the reflection of oneself that is seen on looking into the pupil of anybody's eye or even with the aid of a mirror into one's own. End of The Talking Peoples Recorded by Ashwin Jain Part 3 of a selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese studio, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Poo Songling. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Volume 1, Part 3. The Painted Wall. Recording by Ashwin Jain A Kyangsi gentleman named Meng Lu Tan was lodging at the capital with a Mr. Chu, M.A., when one day chance led him to a certain monastery, within which they found no spacious halls or meditation chambers, but only an old priest in dishabille. On observing the visitors, he arranged his dress and went forward to meet them, leading them round and showing whatever there was to be seen. In the chapel they saw an image of Chi Kung, and the walls on either side were beautifully painted with life-like representations of men and animals. On the east side were pictured a number of fairies, among whom was a young girl whose maiden tresses were not yet confined by the matron's knot. She was picking flowers and gently smiling, while her cherry lips seemed about to move and the moisture of her eyes to overflow. Mr. Chu gazed for a long time without taking his eyes off her, until at last he became unconscious of anything but the thoughts that were engrossing him. Then suddenly he felt himself floating in the air as if riding on a cloud and found himself passing through the wall, where halls and pavilions stretched away one after another, unlike the abodes of mortals. Here an old priest was preaching the law of Buddha, surrounded by a large crowd of listeners. Mr. Chu mingled with the throng, and after a few moments perceived a gentle tug at his sleeve. Turning round, he saw the young girl above mentioned, who walked laughing away. Mr. Chu at once followed her, and passing a winding balustrade arrived at a small apartment beyond which he dared not to venture further. But the young lady, looking back, waved the flowers she had in her hand as though beckoning him to come on. He accordingly entered and found nobody else within. 
Then they fell on their knees and worshipped heaven and earth together, and rose up as man and wife, after which the bride went away, bidding Mr. Chu keep quiet until she came back. This went on for a couple of days, when the young lady's companions began to smell a rat and discovered Mr. Chu's hiding place. Thereupon they all laughed and said, My dear, you are now a married woman, and should leave off that maidenly coiffer. So they gave her the proper hairpins and head ornaments, and bade her go bind her hair, at which she blushed very much but said nothing. Then one of them cried out, My sisters, let us be off, two's company knows none. At this they all giggled again and went away. Mr. Chu found his wife very much improved by the alteration in the style of her hair. The high top knot and the coronet of pendants were very becoming to her. But suddenly they heard a sound like the tramping of heavy soled boots, accompanied by the clanking of chains and the noise of angry discussion. The bride jumped up in a fright, and she and Mr. Chu peeped out. They saw a man clad in golden armor, with a face as black as jet, carrying in his hands chains and whips, and surrounded by all the girls. He asked, Are you all here? All, they replied. If, said he, any mortal is here concealed amongst you, denounce him at once, and lay not up sorrow for yourselves. Here, they all answered as before that there was no one. The man then made a movement as he would search the place upon which the bride was dreadfully alarmed and her face turned the color of ashes. In her terror, she said to Mr. Chu, Hide yourself under the bed, and opening a small lattice in the wall, disappeared herself. Mr. Chu, in his concealment, hardly dared to draw his breath, and in a little while he heard the boot stamp into the room and out again. The sound of the voices getting gradually fainter and fainter in the distance. This reassured him, but he still heard the voices of people going backwards and forwards outside, and having been a long time in a grand position, his ears began to sing, as if there was a locust in them, and his eyes to burn like fire. It was almost unbearable, however. He remained quietly awaiting the return of the young lady, without giving a thought to the why and wherefore of his present position. Meanwhile, Meng Lutan had noticed the sudden disappearance of his friend, and thinking something was wrong, asked the priest where he was. He has gone to hear the preaching of the law, replied the priest. Where? said Mr. Meng, or oh, not very far, was the answer. Then with his finger, the old priest tapped the wall and called out, Friend Chu, what makes you stay away so long? At this, the likeness of Mr. Chu was figured upon the wall, with his ear inclined in the attitude of one listening. The priest added, Your friend here has been waiting for you some time. And immediately Mr. Chu descended from the wall, standing transfixed like a block of wood, with staring eyeballs and trembling legs. Mr. Meng was much terrified, and asked him quietly what was the matter. Now the matter was that, while concealed under the bed, he had heard a noise resembling thunder, and had rushed out to see what it was. Here, they all noticed that the young lady on the wall, with the maiden tresses, had changed the style of her coiffure to that of a married woman. Mr. Chu was greatly astonished at this, and asked the old priest the reason. 
he replied. Visions have their origin in those who see them. What explanation can I give? This answer was very unsatisfactory to Mr. Chu. Neither did his friend, who was rather frightened, knew what to make out of it all. So they descended the temple steps and went away. Footnotes 1. He found himself passing through the wall. This will doubtless remind the reader of Alice through the looking glass and what she saw there. Number 2. They fell on their knees and worshipped heaven and earth together. The all-important item of a Chinese marriage ceremony, amounting, in fact, to calling God to witness the contract. End of The Painted Wall Recording by Ashwin Jain Part 4 of a selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Poole Songling Translated by Herbert Allen Giles Volume 1 Part 4 Planting a Pear Tree Read by Ashwin Jain A countryman was one day selling his pears in the market. They were unusually sweet and fine flavored and the price he asked was high. A Taoist priest in raps and tatters stopped at the barrow and begged one of them. The countryman told him to go away, but as he did not do so, he began to curse and swear at him. The priest said, You have several hundred peers on your barrow. I ask for a single one, the loss of which, sir, you will not feel. Why then get angry? The lookers on told the countryman to give him an inferior one and let him go, but this he obstinately refused to do. Thereupon, the beadle of the place, finding the commotion too great, purchased a pear and handed it to the priest. The latter received it with a bow and turning to the crowd said, We who have left our homes and given up all that is dear to us, are at a loss to understand selfish niggardly conduct in others. Now I have some exquisite peers, which I shall do myself the honor to put before you. Here somebody asked, Since you have the peers yourself, why don't you eat those? Because, replied the priest, I wanted one of those pips to grow them from. So saying, he munched up the pear, and when he had finished, took a pip in his hand, and strapped a pig from his back, and proceeded to make a hole in the ground, several inches deep, wherein he deposited the pip, filling in the earth as before. He then asked the bystanders for a little hot water to water it with, and one among them, who loved a joke, fed him with some boiling water from a neighboring shop. The priest poured this over the place where he had made the hole, and every eye was fixed upon him when sprouts were seen shooting up and gradually growing larger and larger. By and by, there was a tree with branches sparsely covered with leaves, then flowers, and last of all fine, large, sweet-smelling pears hanging in great profusion. These the priest picked and handed round to the assembled crowd until all were gone. When he took his pick and hacked away for a long time at the tree, finally cutting it down. This he shouldered, leaves and all, and sauntered quietly away. Now, from the very beginning, our friend, the countryman, had been amongst the crowd, straining his neck to see what was going on. 
and forgetting all about his business. At the departure of the priest, he turned round and discovered that every one of his peers was gone. He then knew that those the old fellow had been giving away so freely were really his own peers. Looking more closely at the barrow, he also found that one of the handles was missing, evidently having been newly cut off. Boiling with rage, he set out in pursuit of the priest, and just as he turned the corner, he saw the lost barrow handle lying under the wall, being in fact the very pear tree the priest had cut down. But there were no traces of the priest, much to the amusement of the crowd in the marketplace. Footnotes 1. Taoist that is, of the religion of Tao, a system of philosophy founded some six centuries before the Christian era by a man named Lao Tzu, old boy, who was said to have been born with white hair and a beard. It is now but a shadow of its former self. It is now but a shadow of its former self and is corrupted by the grossest forms of superstition borrowed from Buddhism, which has in its turn adopted many of the forms and beliefs of Taoism, so that the two religions are hardly distinguishable one from the other. Quote, what seemed to me the most singular circumstance connected with the matter was the presence of half a dozen Taoist priests who joined in all the ceremonies, doing everything that the Buddhist priests did, and presenting very odd appearance, with their top knots and cues, among their closely shaving Buddhist brethren. It seemed strange that the worship of Sakyamuni by celibate Buddhist priests with shaved heads, into which holes were duly burned at their initiation, should be participated in by married Taoist priests whose heads are not wholly shaven and have never been burned." Unquote. The Initiation of Buddhist Priests at Kushan by S. L. B. Taoist priests are credited with the knowledge of alchemy and the black art in general. Footnote 2 We who have left our homes and given up all that is dear to us as celibate priesthood belongs properly to Buddhism and is not a doctrine of the Taoist Church. End of Planting a Pear Tree Read by Ashwin Jain Part 5 of A Selection of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Volume 1, Part 5. The Taoist Priest of Lao Shan. Read by Alan Davis Drake. There lived in our village a Mr. Wang, the seventh son of an old family. This gentleman had a penchant for the Taoist religion, and hearing that at Lao Shan there were plenty of immortals, shouldered his knapsack and went off for a tour thither. Ascending a peak of the mountain he reached a secluded monastery, where he found the priest sitting on a rush mat, with long hair flowing over his neck and a pleasant expression on his face. Making a low bow, Wang addressed him thus. Mysterious indeed is the doctrine. I pray you, sir, instruct me therein. Delicately nurtured and wanting in energy as you are, replied the priest, I fear you could not support the fatigue. Try me, said Wang. So when the disciples, who were very many in number, collected together at dusk, Wang joined them in making obeisance to the priest, 
and remained with them in the monastery very early next morning the priest summoned wang and giving him a hatchet sent him out with the others to cut firewood wang respectfully obeyed continuing to work for over a month until his hands and feet were so swollen and blistered that he secretly meditated returning home one evening when he came back he found two strangers sitting drinking with his master it being already dark and no lamp or candles having been brought in the old priest took some scissors and cut out a circular piece of paper like a mirror which he proceeded to stick against the wall immediately it became a dazzling moon by the light of which you could have seen a hair or a beard of corn the disciples all came crowding round to wait upon them but one of the strangers said on a festive occasion like this we ought all to enjoy ourselves together accordingly he took a kettle of wine from the table and presented it to the disciples bidding them to drink each his fill whereupon our friend wang began to wonder how seven or eight of them could be served out of a single kettle the disciples too rushed about in search of cups each struggling to get the first drink for fear the wine should be exhausted nevertheless all the candidates failed to empty the kettle at which they were very much astonished when suddenly one of the strangers said you have given us a fine bright moon but it's dull work drinking by ourselves why not call chang go to join us he then seized the chopstick and threw it into the moon whereupon a lovely girl stepped forth from its beams at first she was only a foot high but on reaching the ground lengthened to the ordinary size of a woman she had a slender waist and a beautiful neck and went most gracefully through the red garment figure when this was finished she sang the following words ye fairies ye fairies i'm coming back soon too lonely and cold is my home in the moon her voice was clear and well sustained ringing like the notes of a flageolet and when she had concluded her song she pirouetted round and jumped up on the table where with every eye fixed in astonishment upon her she once more became a chopstick the three friends laughed loudly and one of them said we are very jolly to-night but i have hardly room for any more wine will you drink a parting glass with me in the palace of the moon they then took up the table and walked into the moon where they could be seen drinking so plainly that their eyebrows and beards appeared like reflections in a looking-glass by and by the moon became obscured and when the disciples brought a lighted candle they found the priest sitting in the dark alone the viands however were still upon the table and the mirror-like piece of paper on the wall have you all had enough to drink asked the priest to which they answered that they had in that case he said you had better get to bed so as not to be behindhand with your wood-cutting in the morning so they all went off and among them wang who was delighted at what he had seen and thought no more of returning home but after a time he could not stand it any longer and as the priest taught him no magical arts he determined not to wait but went to him and said sir i have travelled many long miles for the benefit of your instruction if you will not teach me the secret of immortality let me at any rate learn some trifling trick and so soothe my cravings for a knowledge of your art i have now been here two or three months doing nothing but chop firewood out in the morning and back at night work to which i was never accustomed in my own home did i not tell you replied the priest that you would never support the fatigue to-morrow i will start you on your way home sir said wang i have worked for you a long time teach me some small art that my coming here may not have been wholly in vain what art asked the priest well answered wang i have noticed that whenever you walk about anywhere 
walls and so on are no obstacles for you teach me this and i'll be satisfied the priest laughingly assented and taught wang a formula which he bade him recite when he had done so he told him to walk through the wall but wang seeing the wall in front of him didn't like to walk at it as however the priest bade him try he walked quietly up to it and was there stopped the priest here called out don't go slowly put your head down and rush at it so wang stepped back a few paces and went at full speed and the wall yielded to him as he passed in a moment he found himself outside delighted at this he went in to thank the priest who told him to be careful in the use of his power or otherwise there would be no response handing him at the same time some money for his expenses on the way when wang got home he went about bragging of his taoist friends and his contempt for walls in general but his wife disbelieved his story he set about going through the performance as before stepping back from the wall he rushed at it full speed with his head down but coming in contact with the hard bricks finished up in a heap on the floor his wife picked him up and found he had a bump on his forehead as big as a large egg at which she roared with laughter but wang was overwhelmed with rage and shame and cursed the old priest for his base ingratitude footnotes one immortals the angels of taoism immortality in a happy land being the reward held out for a life of earth in accordance with the doctrines of tao taoist priests are believed by some to possess an elixir of immortality in the form of a precious liquor others again hold that the elixir consists solely in the virtuous conduct of life two chang go the beautiful wife of a legendary chieftain named hu yi who flourished about twenty five hundred b c she is said to have stolen from her husband the elixir of immortality and to have fled with it to the moon three the red garment figure the name of a celebrated pasul of antiquity end of the taoist priest of lao shan Part 6 of a section from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Volume 1, Part 6 The Buddhist Priest of Changqing. Read by Allen Davis Drake. At Changqing there lived a Buddhist priest of exceptional virtue and purity of conduct, who, though over eighty years of age, was still hale and hearty. One day he fell down and could not move and when the other priest rushed to help him up, they found he was already gone. The old priest was himself unconscious of death. His soul flew away to the borders of the province of Honan. Now it chanced that the scion of an old family residing in Honan, with some ten or a dozen followers, to hunt the hare with falcons. But his horse having run away with him, he fell off and was killed just at that moment the soul of the priest came by and entered into the body which thereupon gradually recovered consciousness the servants crowded round to ask him how he felt when opening his eyes wide he cried out how did i get here they assisted him to rise and led him into the house where all his ladies came to see him and inquire how he did in great amazement he said I am a Buddhist priest. How came I hither? His servants thought he was wandering, and tried to recall him by pulling his ears. As for himself, he could make nothing of it, 
and closing his eyes refrained from saying anything further for food he would only eat rice refusing all wine and meat and avoided the society of his wives after some days he felt inclined for a stroll at which all his family were delighted but no sooner had he got outside and stopped for a little rest than he was besieged by servants begging him to take their accounts as usual however he pleaded illness and want of strength and no more was said when he took occasion to ask if they knew the district of chang ching and on being answered in the affirmative expressed his intentions of going thither for a trip as he felt anxious about those he had left to their own resources at the same time bidding the servants look after his affairs at home they tried to dissuade him from this on the ground of his having but recently risen from a sick bed but he paid no heed to their remonstrances and on the very next day set out arriving at the chung ching district he found everything unchanged and without being put to the necessity of asking the road made his way straight to the monastery his former disciples received him with every token of respect as an honored visitor and in reply to his questions as to where the old priest was they informed him that their worthy teacher had been dead for some time on asking to be shown his grave they led him to a spot where there was a solitary mound some three feet high over which the grass was not yet green not one of them knew his motives for visiting this place and by and by he ordered his horse saying to the disciples your master was a virtuous priest carefully preserve whatever relics of him you may have and keep them from injury they all promised to do this and he set off on his way home when he arrived there he fell into a listless state and took no interest in his family affairs so much so that after a few months he ran away and went straight to his former home at the monastery telling the disciples that he was their old master this they refused to believe and laughed among themselves at his pretensions but he told them the whole story and recalled many instances of his previous life among them until at last they were convinced he then occupied his old bed and went through the same daily routines as before paying no attention to the repeated entreaties of his family who came with carriages and horses to beg him to return about a year subsequently his wife sent one of the servants with splendid presents of gold and silk all of which he refused with the exception of a single linen robe and whenever any of his old friends passed the monastery they always went to pay him their respect finding him quiet dignified and pure he was then barely thirty though he had been a priest for more than eighty years footnotes one to hunt the hare with falcons this form of sport may still be seen in the north of china a hare being started two chinese greyhounds which are very slow are slipped from their leash in pursuit but as the hare would easily run straight away from them a falcon is released almost simultaneously the latter soars to a considerable height and then swoops down on the hare striking it a violent blow with the pounce or claw this partially stuns the hare and allows the dogs to regain lost ground the chase is ended by the hare getting to earth in a fox burrow or being ultimately overtaken by the dogs in the latter case the heart and liver are cut out on the spot and given to the falcon otherwise he would hunt no more that day two falcons are often released one shortly after the other they wear hoods which are removed at the moment of flying and are attached by a slipstring from one leg to the falconer's wrist during the night previous to a day's hunting they are not allowed to sleep each falconer lies down with one falcon on his left wrist and keeps up an insistent tapping with the other hand on the bird's head this is done to make them fierce should the quarry escape a hare skin is thrown down by which means the falcons are secured 
and made ready for a further flight occasionally but rarely the falcon misses its blow with the hare with the result of a broken or injured arm two for food he would only eat rice refusing all wine and meat and avoided the society of his wives abstinence from wine and meat and celibacy are among the most important rules of the buddhist church as specially applied to its priesthood at the door of every buddhist monastery may be seen a notice that no wine or meat may enter here even the laity are not supposed to drink wine three he was then barely thirty though he had been a priest for more than eighty years having renewed his youth by assuming the body of the young man into which the soul had entered end of the buddhist priest of chang ching part seven of a selection from strange stories from a chinese studio volume one this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Songling Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, Volume 1, Part 7 The Marriage of the Fox's Daughter A president of the Board of Civil Office named Yin and a native of Li Cheng, when a young man was very badly off, but was endowed with considerable physical courage. Now in this part of the country there was a large establishment, covering several acres, with an unbroken succession of pavilions and verandas, and belonging to one of the old county families. But because ghosts and apparitions were frequently seen there, the place had for a long time remained untenanted, and was overgrown with grass and weeds, no one venturing to enter even in broad daylight. One evening, when Yin was carousing with some fellow students, one of them jokingly said, If anybody will pass the night in the haunted house, the rest of us will stand him a dinner. Mr. Yin jumped up at this, and cried out, What is that difficult in that? So, taking with him a sleeping mat, he proceeded thither, escorted by all his companions as far as the door, where they laughed and said, "'We will wait here a little while. In case you see anything, shout out to us at once.' "'If there are any goblins or foxes,' replied Ian, "'I'll catch them for you.' He then went in and found the paths obliterated by long grass which had sprung up, mingled with weeds of various kinds. It was just the time of the new moon, and by its feeble light he was able to make out the door of the house. Feeling his way, he walked on until he reached the back pavilion, and then went up onto the moon terrace, which was such a pleasant spot that he determined to stop there. Gazing westwards, he sat for a long time looking at the moon, a single thread of light embracing in its horns the peak of a hill, without hearing anything at all unusual. So, laughing to himself at the nonsense people talked, he spread his mat upon the floor, put a stone under his head for a pillow, and lay down to sleep. He had watched the cowherd and the lady until they were just disappearing, and was on the point of dropping off, when suddenly he heard footsteps down below coming up the stairs. Pretending to be asleep, he saw a servant enter, carrying in his hands a lotus-shaped lantern, who, on observing Mr. Yin, rushed back in a fright and said to someone behind, "'There is a stranger here.' The person spoken to asked who it was, but the servant did not know. Then up came an old gentleman, who, after examining Mr. Yin closely, said, "'It's the future president. He's as drunk as can be.' We needn't mind him, and besides he's a good fellow and won't give us any trouble. So they walked in and opened all the doors, and by and by there were a great many other people moving about, and quantities of lamps were lighted till the place was as light as day. 
About this time Mr. Yin slightly changed his position and sneezed, upon which the old man, perceiving that he was awake, came forward and fell down on his knees, saying, "'Sir, I have a daughter who is to be married this very night. It was not anticipated that your honour would be here. I pray, therefore, that we may be excused.' Mr. Yin got up and raised the old man, regretting that in his ignorance of the festive occasion he had brought with him no present. "'Ah, sir,' replied the old man, "'your very presence here will ward off all noxious influences, and that is quite enough for us.' He then begged Mr. Yin to assist in doing the honours, and thus double the obligation already conferred. Mr. Yin readily assented, and went inside to look at the gorgeous arrangements they had made. He was here met by a lady, apparently about forty years of age, whom the old gentleman introduced as his wife, and he had hardly made his bow when he heard the sound of flagellates, and someone came hurrying in, saying, "'He has come!' The old gentleman flew out to meet this personage, and Mr. Yin also stood up, awaiting his arrival. In no long time a bevy of people with gauze lanterns ushered in the bridegroom himself, who seemed to be about seventeen or eighteen years old, and of a most refined and prepossessing appearance. The old gentleman bade him pay his respects first to their worthy guest, and upon his looking towards Mr. Yin, that gentleman came forward to welcome him on behalf of the host. Then followed ceremonies between the old man and his son-in-law, and when these were over they all sat down to supper. Hosts of waiting-maids brought in profuse quantities of wine and meats, with bowls and cups of jade or gold, till the table glittered again, and when the wine had gone round several times, the old gentleman told one of the maids to summon the bride. This she did, but some time passed and no bride came, so the old man rose and drew aside the curtain pressing the young lady to come forth, whereupon a number of women escorted out the bride, whose ornaments went tinkle-tinkle as she walked along, sweet perfumes being all the time diffused around. Her father told her to make the proper salutation, after which she went and sat by her mother. Mr. Yin took a glance at her, and saw that she wore in her head beautiful ornaments made of kingfisher's feathers, her beauty quite surpassing anything he had ever seen. All this time they had been drinking their wine out of golden goblets big enough to hold several pints, when it flashed across him that one of these goblets would be a capital thing to carry back to his companions in evidence of what he had seen. So he secreted it in his sleeve, and pretending to be tipsy, leaned forward with his head upon the table as if going off to sleep. "'The gentleman is drunk!' said the guests, and by and by Mr. Yin heard the bridegroom take his leave, when there was a general trooping downstairs to the tune of a wedding march. When they were all gone the old gentleman collected the goblets, one of which was missing, though they hunted high and low to find it. Someone mentioned the sleeping guest, but the old gentleman stopped him at once for fear Mr. Yin should hear, and before long silence reigned throughout. Mr. Yin then arose. It was dark, and he had no light, but he could detect the lingering smell of the food, and the place was filled with the fumes of wine. Faint streaks of light now appearing in the east, he began quietly to make a move, having first satisfied himself that the goblet was still in his sleeve. Arriving at the door, he found his friends already there, for they had been afraid he might come out after they left and go in again early in the morning. When he produced the goblet they were all lost in astonishment, and on hearing his story they were fain to believe it, well knowing that a poor student like Yin was not likely to have such a valuable piece of plate in his possession. Later on Mr. Yin took his doctor's degree, and was appointed magistrate over the district of Fei Chu, where there was an old established family of the name of Chu. The head of the family asked him to a banquet in honour of his arrival, and ordered the servants to bring in the large goblets. After some delay a slave-girl came and whispered something to her master, 
which seemed to make him very angry. Then the goblets were brought in, and Mr. Yin was invited to drink. He now found that these goblets were of precisely the same shape and pattern as the one he had at home, and at once begged his host to tell him where he had had these made. "'Well,' said Mr. Chu, "'there should be eight of them. An ancestor of mine had them made when he was minister at the capital by an experienced artificer. They have been handed down in our family from generation to generation, and have now been carefully laid by for some time, but I thought we would have them out to-day as a compliment to your honour. However, there are only seven to be found. None of the servants can have touched them, for the old seals of ten years ago are still on the box unbroken. I don't know what to make of it. Mr. Yin laughed and said, It must have flown away. Still, it is a pity to lose an heirloom of that kind, and as I have a very similar one at home, I shall take it upon myself to send it to you. When the banquet was over, Mr. Yin went home, and taking out his own goblet, sent it off to Mr. Chu. The latter was somewhat surprised to find that it was identical with his own, and hurried away to thank the magistrate for his gift, asking him at the same time how it had come into his possession. Mr. Yin told him the whole story, which proves conclusively that though a fox may obtain possession of a thing, even at a distance of many hundred miles, he will not venture to keep it altogether. 1. The Board of Civil Office One of the six boards, now seven, at the capital, equivalent to our own war office, board of works, etc. 2. The moon, a single thread of light embracing in its horns the peak of a hill, this, of course, is impossible. 3. The cowherd and the lady. The Chinese names for certain stars. Beta Gamma Aquilae and Alpha Lyrae. 4. The lotus-shaped lantern. Lanterns very prettily made to resemble all kinds of flowers that are to be seen at the Chinese New Year. 5. In his ignorance of the festive occasion, he had brought with him no present. This is, as with us, obligatory on all friends invited to a marriage. 6. The sound of flagellates, the accompaniment of all weddings and funerals in China. 7. Pretending to be tipsy. The soberest people in the world, among whom anything like sottishness is comparatively unknown, think it no disgrace, but rather complimentary, to get pleasantly tipsy on all festive occasions, and people who are physically unable to do so frequently go so far as to hire substitutes to drink for them. Mandarins especially suffer very much from the custom of being obliged to take wine with a large number of guests. 8. The wedding party was, of course, composed entirely of foxes, this animal being believed by the Chinese to be capable of appearing at will under the human form, and of doing either good or evil to its friends or foes. These facts will be prominently brought out in several of the stories to follow. End of the Marriage of the Fox's Daughter Part 8 of A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling Translated by Herbert Allen Giles Volume 1, Part 8. Miss Chow No. Kung Sue Li was a descendant of Confucius. He was a man of considerable ability, and an excellent poet. A fellow student, to whom he was much attached, became magistrate at Tian Tai, and sent for Kung to join him. Unfortunately, just before Kung arrived, his friend died, and he found himself without the means of returning home. So he took up his abode in a Buddhist monastery, where he was employed in transcribing for the priests. Several hundred paces to the west of this monastery there was a house belonging to a Mr. Shan, a gentleman who had known better days, 
but who had spent all his money in a heavy lawsuit, and then, as his family was a small one, had gone away to live in the country and left his house vacant. One day there was a heavy fall of snow which kept visitors away from the monastery, and Kung, finding it dull, went out. As he was passing by the door of the above-mentioned house, a young man of very elegant appearance came forth, who the moment he saw Kung ran up to him and with a bow entered into conversation, asking him to be pleased to walk in. Kung was much taken with the young man, and followed him inside. The rooms were not particularly large, but adorned throughout with embroidered curtains, and from the walls hung scrolls and drawings by celebrated masters. On the table lay a book, the title of which was Jottings from Paradise, and turning over its leaves Kung found therein many strange things. He did not ask the young man his name, presuming that as he lived in the Shan family mansion he was necessarily the owner of the place. The young man, however, inquired what he was doing in that part of the country, and expressed great sympathy with his misfortunes, recommending him to set about taking pupils. Alas, said Kung, who will play the miserness to a distressed wayfarer like myself? If, replied the young man, you would condescend so far, I for my part would gladly seek instruction at your hands. Kung was much gratified at this, but said he dared not arrogate to himself the position of teacher, and begged merely to be considered as the young man's friend. He then asked him why the house had been shut up for so long, to which the young man replied, This is the Shan family mansion. It has been closed all this time because of the owner's removal into the country. My surname is Huang Fu, and my home is in Shenxi. But as our house has been burnt down in a great fire, we have put up here for a while. Thus Mr. Kung found out that his name was not Shan. That evening they spent in laughing and talking together, and Kung remained there for the night. In the morning a lad came in to light the fire, and the young man, rising first, went into the private part of the house. Mr. Kung was sitting up with the bedclothes still huddled round him, when the lad looked in and said, Mass is coming. So he jumped up with a start, and in came an old man with a silvery beard, who began to thank him, saying, I am very much obliged to you for your condescension in becoming my son's tutor. At present he writes a villainous hand, and I can only hope you will not allow the ties of friendship to interfere with discipline. Thereupon he presented Mr. Kung with an embroidered suit of clothes, a sable hat, and a set of shoes and stockings, and when the latter had washed and dressed himself he called for wine and food. Kung could not make out what the valances of the chairs and tables were made of. They were so very bright and dazzling. By and by, when the wine had circulated several times, the old gentleman picked up his walking-stick and took his leave. After breakfast the young man handed in his theme, which turned out to be written in an archaic style and not at all after the modern fashion of essay-writing. Kung asked him why he had done this, to which the young man replied that he did not contemplate competing at the public examinations. In the evening they had another drinking bout, but it was agreed that there should be no more of it after that night. The young man then called the boy and told him to see if his father was asleep or not adding that if he was he might quietly summon Miss Perfume. The boy went off, first taking a guitar out of a very pretty case, and in a few minutes in came a very nice-looking young girl. The young man bade her play the death of Shun, and seizing an ivory plectrum she swept the chords, pouring forth a vocal melody of exquisite sweetness and pathos. He then gave her a goblet of wine to drink, and it was midnight before they parted. Next morning they got up early and settled down to work. The young man proved an apt scholar. He could remember what he had once read, and at the end of two or three months had made astonishing progress. 
Then they agreed that every five days they would indulge in a symposium, and that Miss Perfume should always be of the party. One night, when the wine had gone into Kung's head, he seemed to be lost in a reverie, whereupon his young friend, who knew what was the matter with him, said, "'This girl was brought up by my father. I know you find it lonely, and I have long been looking out for a nice wife for you.' "'Let her only resemble Miss Perfume,' said Kung, "'and she will do.' "'Your experience,' said the young man, laughing, "'is but limited, and consequently anything is a surprise to you. "'If Miss Perfume is your beau ideal, "'why, it will not be difficult to satisfy you.' "'Some six months had passed away, "'when one day Mr. Kung took it into his head "'that he would like to go out for a stroll in the country.' The entrance, however, was carefully closed, and on asking the reason, the young man told him that his father wished to receive no guests for fear of causing interruption to his studies. So Kung thought no more about it, and by and by, when the heat of summer came on, they moved their study to a pavilion in the garden. At this time Mr. Kung had a swelling on the chest about as big as a peach, which in a single night increased to the size of a bowl. There he lay groaning with the pain, while his pupil waited upon him day and night. He slept badly and took hardly any food, and in a few days the place got so much worse that he could neither eat nor drink. The old gentleman also came in, and he and his son lamented over him together. Then the young man said, I was thinking last night that my sister Chow No would be able to cure Mr. Kung, and accordingly I sent over to my grandmother's asking her to come. She ought to be here by now. At that moment a servant entered and announced to Miss Chow No, who had come with her cousin, having been at her aunt's house. Her father and brother ran out to meet her, and then brought her in to see Mr. Kung. She was between thirteen and fourteen years old, and had beautiful eyes with a very intelligent expression in them, and a most graceful figure besides. No sooner had Mr. Kung beheld this lovely creature than he quite forgot to groan, and began to brighten up. Meanwhile the young man was saying, "'This respected friend of mine is the same to me as a brother. Try, sister, to cure him.' Miss Chano immediately dismissed her blushes, and rolling up her long sleeves approached the bed to feel his pulse. As she was grasping his wrist, Kung became conscious of a perfume more delicate than that of the epidendrum, and then she laughed, saying, "'This illness was to be expected, for the heart is touched. Though it is severe, a cure can be effected, but as there is already a swelling, not without using the knife.' Then she drew from her arm a gold bracelet which she pressed down upon the suffering spot, until by degrees the swelling rose within the bracelet and overtopped it by an inch and more the outlying parts that were inflamed also passing under, and thus very considerably reducing the extent of the tumour. With one hand she opened her robe and took out a knife with an edge as keen as paper, and pressing the bracelet down all the time with the other, proceeded to cut lightly round near the root of the swelling. The dark blood gushed forth and stained the bed and the mat, but Mr. Kung was delighted to be near such a beauty, not only felt no pain, but would willingly have continued the operation that she might sit by him a little longer. In a few moments the whole thing was removed, and looked like a growth which had been cut off a tree. Here Miss Chow No called for water to wash the wound, and from between her lips she took a red pill as big as a bullet, which she laid upon the flesh, and after drawing the skin together, passed round and round the place. The first turn felt like the searing of a hot iron, the second like a gentle itching, and at the third he experienced a sensation of lightness and coolness, which penetrated into his very bones and marrow. The young lady then returned the pill to her mouth, and said, He is cured, hurrying away as fast as she could. Mr. Kung jumped up to thank her, and found that his complaint had quite disappeared. Her beauty, however, had made such an impression on him that his troubles were hardly at an end. From this moment he gave up his books and took no interest in anything. This state of things was soon noticed by the young man, who said to him, My brother, I have found a fine match for you, 
"'Who is it to be?' asked Kung. "'Oh, one of the family,' replied his friend. Thereupon Mr. Kung remained some time lost in thought, and at length said, "'Please don't.' Then turning his face to the wall, he repeated these lines. Speak not of lakes and streams to him who once has seen the sea. The clouds that circle Wu's peak are the only clouds for me. The young man guessed to whom he was alluding, and replied, My father has a very high opinion of your talents, and will gladly receive you into the family, but that he has only one daughter, and she is much too young. My cousin Ah Sung, however, is seventeen years old, and not at all a bad-looking girl. If you doubt my word, you can wait in the veranda until she takes her daily walk in the garden, and thus judge for yourself. This Mr. Kung acceded to, and accordingly saw Miss Chow No come out with a lovely girl, her black eyebrows beautifully arched, and her tiny feet encased in phoenix-shaped shoes, as like one another as they well could be. He was of course delighted, and begged the young man to arrange all preliminaries, and the very next day his friend came to tell him that the affair was finally settled. A portion of the house was given up to the bride and bridegroom, and the marriage was celebrated with plenty of music and hosts of guests, more like a fairy wedding than anything else. Mr. Kung was very happy, and began to think that the position of paradise had been wrongly laid down until one day the young man came to him and said, "'For the trouble you have been at in teaching me, I shall ever remain your debtor. At the present moment the Shan family lawsuit has been brought to termination, and they wish to resume possession of their house immediately. We therefore propose returning to Shensi, and as it is unlikely that you and I will ever meet again, I feel very sorrowful at the prospect of parting.' Mr. Kung replied that he would go too, but the young man advised him to return to his old home. This, he observed, was no easy matter, upon which the young man said, "'Don't let that trouble you. I will see you safe there.' By and by his father came in with Mr. Kung's wife, and presented Mr. Kung with one hundred ounces of gold, and then the young man gave the husband and wife each one of his hands to grasp, bidding them shut their eyes. The next instant they were floating away in the air, with the wind whizzing in their ears. In a little while he said, "'You have arrived,' and opening his eyes Kung beheld his former home. Then he knew that the young man was not a human being. Joyfully he knocked at the old door, and his mother was astonished to see him arrive with such a nice wife. They were all rejoicing together when he turned round and found that his friend had disappeared. His wife attended on her mother-in-law with great devotion, and acquired a reputation both for virtue and beauty, which was spread round far and near. Some time passed away, and then Mr. Kung took his doctor's degree, and was appointed governor of the jail in Yangnan. He proceeded to his post with his wife only, the journey being too long for his mother, and by and by a son was born. Then he got into trouble by being too honest an official, and threw up his appointment, but had not the wherewithal to get home again. One day when out hunting he met a handsome young man riding on a nice horse, and seeing that he was staring very hard looked closely at him. It was young Huang Fu. So they drew bridle and fell to laughing and crying by turns, the young man then inviting Kung to go along with him. They rode on together until they had reached a village thickly shaded with trees, so that the sun and sky were invisible overhead, and entered into a most elaborately decorated mansion, such as might belong to an old established family. Kung asked after Miss Chow No, and heard that she was married, also that his own mother-in-law was dead, at which tidings he was greatly moved. Next day he went back and returned again with his wife. Chao No also joined them, and taking up Kung's child, played with it, saying, Your mother played as truant. Mr. Kung did not forget to thank her for her former kindness to him, to which she replied, You're a great man now. Though the wound has healed, haven't you forgotten the pain yet? Her husband, too, came to pay his respects, returning with her on the following morning.
One day the young Huang Fu seemed troubled in spirit, and said to Mr. Kung, A great calamity is impending. Can you help us? Mr. Kung did not know what he was alluding to, but readily promised his assistance. The young man then ran out and summoned the whole family to worship in the ancestral hall, at which Mr. Kung was alarmed and asked what it all meant. "'You know,' answered the young man, "'I am not a man but a fox. "'Today we shall be attacked by thunder, "'and if only you will aid us in our trouble "'we may still hope to escape. "'If you are unwilling, take your child and go, "'that you may not be involved with us.' Mr. Kung protested he would live or die with them, and so the young man placed him with a sword at the door, bidding him remain quiet there in spite of all the thunder. He did as he was told, and soon saw black clouds obscuring the light until it was all as dark as pitch. Looking round, he could see that the house had disappeared, and that its place was occupied by a huge mound and a bottomless pit. In the midst of his terror a fearful peal was heard which shook the very hills, accompanied by a violent wind and driving rain. Old trees were torn up, and Mr. Kung became both dazed and deaf. Yet he stood firm until he saw in a dense black column of smoke a horrid thing with a sharp beak and long claws, with which it snatched someone from the hole and was disappearing up with the smoke. In an instant, Kung knew by her clothes and shoes that the victim was no other than Chao No, and instantly jumping up he struck the devil violently with his sword and cut it down. Immediately the mountains were riven, and a sharp peal of thunder laid Kung dead upon the ground. Then the clouds cleared away, and Chao No gradually came round to find Kung dead at her feet. She burst out crying at the sight and declared that she would not live since Kung had died for her. Kung's wife also came out, and they bore the body inside. Chao No then made Ah Sung hold her husband's head, while her brother prized open his teeth with a hairpin, and she herself arranged his jaw. She next put a red pill into his mouth, and bending down breathed into him. The pill went along with the current of air, and presently there was a gurgle in his throat, and he came round. Seeing all the family about him, he was disturbed as if waking from a dream. However, they were all united together, and fear gave place to joy. But Mr. Kung objected to live in that out-of-the-way place, and proposed that they should return with him to his native village. To this they were only too pleased to assent, all except Chao No, and when Mr. Kung invited her husband Mr. Wu as well, she said she feared her father and mother-in-law would not like to lose the children. They had tried all day to persuade her, but without success, when suddenly in rushed one of the Wu family's servants, dripping with perspiration and quite out of breath. They asked what was the matter and the servant replied that the Wu family had been visited by a calamity on the very same day, and had every one perished. Chao No cried very bitterly at this, and could not be comforted, but now there was nothing to prevent them from all returning together. Mr. Kung went into the city for a few days on business, and then they set to work packing up night and day. On arriving at their destination, Separate apartments were allotted to young Mr. Huang Fu, and these he kept carefully shut up, only opening his door to Mr. Kung and his wife. Mr. Kung amused himself with the young man and his sister Chao No, filling up the time with chess, wine, conversation, and good cheer, as if they had been one family. His little boy, Huan, grew up to be a handsome young man, but with a touch of the fox in his composition so that when he showed himself abroad he was immediately recognized as the son of a fox. Footnotes 1. A descendant of Confucius Lineal descendants of Confucius are to be found at this day living together as a clan, near their founder's mausoleum in Shantung. The head of the family is an hereditary hung or duke, and each member enjoys a share of the revenues with which the family has been endowed, 
in well-merited recognition of the undying influence of China's greatest sage. 2. An excellent poet. More or less proficiency in the art of poetry is an absolutely essential qualification for all who present themselves at the great competitive tests by which successful candidates are admitted to Chinese official life. 3. Shan. One of the two celebrated but legendary rulers of China in the golden ages of antiquity. Yao, who abdicated 2357 B.C., nominated as his successor a young and virtuous husbandman named Shun, giving him both his daughters in marriage. At the death of Shun, these ladies are said to have wept so much that their tears literally drenched the bamboos which grew beside their husband's grave, and the speckled bamboo is now commonly known as the bamboo of Shun's wives. 4. To feel his pulse. Volumes have been written by Chinese doctors on the subject of the pulse. They profess to distinguish as many as twenty-four different kinds, among which is one well known to our own practitioners, namely the thready pulse. They moreover make it a point of feeling the pulses of both wrists. 5. Speak not of lakes and streams to him who once has seen the sea. The clouds that circle Wu's peak are the only clouds for me. By a famous poet named Yuan Chen, A.D. 779 to 831. 6. Today we shall be attacked by thunder. The Chinese believe that wicked people are struck by the god of thunder and killed in punishment for some hidden crime. They regard lightning merely as an arrangement with a mirror by which the god is enabled to see his victim. 7. Chess Chinese chess is similar to, but not identical with our game. The board is divided by a river, and the king is confined to a small square of moves on his own territory. The game par excellence in China is Wei Qi, an account of which I contributed to the Temple Bar magazine for January 1877. End of Miss Chow No Part 9 of A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling Translated by Herbert Allen Giles Volume 1, Part 9 Magical Arts Read by David Barnes A certain Mr. Yu was a spirited young fellow, fond of boxing and trials of strength, he was able to take two kettles and swing them round about with the speed of the wind. Now, during the reign of Chung Zheng, when up for the final examination at the capital, his servant became seriously ill. Much troubled at this, he applied to a necromancer in the marketplace, who was skilful at determining the various leases of life allotted to men. Before he had uttered a word, the necromancer asked him, saying, "'Is it not about your servant, sir, that you would consult me?' Mr. Yu was startled at this, and replied that it was. "'The sick man,' continued the necromancer, "'will come to no harm. You, sir, are the one in danger.' Mr. Yu then begged him to cast his nativity, which he proceeded to do, finally saying to Mr. Yu, you have but three days to live. Dreadfully frightened, he remained for some time in a state of stupefaction, when the necromancer quietly observed that he possessed the power of averting this calamity by magic, and would exert it for the sum of ten ounces of silver. But Mr. Yu reflected that life and death are already fixed, and he didn't see how magic could save him. So he refused, and was just going away, whereupon the necromancer said, You grudge this trifling outlay. I hope you will not repent it. 
Mr. Yu's friends also urged him to pay the money, advising him rather to empty his purse than not secure the necromancer's compassion. Mr. Yu, however, would not hear of it, and the three days slipped quickly away. Then he sat down calmly in his inn to see what was going to happen. Nothing did happen all day, and at night he shut his door and trimmed the lamp. Then, with a sword at his side, he awaited the approach of death. By and by the clepsydra showed that two hours had already gone without bringing him any nearer to dissolution, and he was thinking about lying down when he heard a scratching at the window and then saw a tiny little man creep through, carrying a spear on his shoulder, who, on reaching the ground, shot up to the ordinary height. Mr. Yu seized his sword, and at once struck at it, but only succeeded in cutting the air. His visitor instantly shrank down small again, and made an attempt to escape through the crevice of the window but you redoubled his blows and at last brought him to the ground lighting the lamp he found only a paper man cut right through the middle this made him afraid to sleep and he sat up watching until in a little time he saw a horrid hobgoblin creep through the same place no sooner did it touch the ground then he assailed it lustily with his sword, at length cutting it in half. Seeing, however, that both halves kept on wriggling about, and fearing that it might get up again, he went on hacking at it. Every blow told, giving forth a hard sound, and when he came to examine his work, he found a clay image all knocked to pieces. Upon this he moved his seat near to the window, and kept his eye fixed upon the crack. After some time he heard a noise like a bull bellowing outside the window, and something pushed against the window frame with such force as to make the whole house tremble and seem about to fall. Mr. Yu, fearing he should be buried under the ruins, thought he could not do better than fight outside so he accordingly burst open the door with a crash and rushed out. There he found a huge devil, as tall as the house, and he saw by the dim light of the moon that its face was as black as coal. Its eyes shot forth yellow fire. It had nothing either upon its shoulders or feet, but held a bow in its hand and had some arrows at its waist. Mr. Yu was terrified and the devil discharged an arrow at him, which he struck to the ground with his sword. On Mr. Yu preparing to strike, the devil let off another arrow, which the former avoided by jumping aside, the arrow quivering in the wall beyond with a smart crack. The devil here got very angry, and drawing his sword, flourished it like a whirlwind, aiming a tremendous blow at Mr. Yu. Mr. Yu ducked, and the whole force of the blow fell upon the stone wall of the house, cutting it right in two. Mr. Yu then ran out from between the devil's legs and began hacking at its back. Whack! Whack! The devil now became furious and roared like thunder, turning round to get another blow at his assailant. But Mr. Yu again ran between his legs, the devil's sword merely cutting off a piece of his coat. Once more he hacked away, whack, whack, and at length the devil came tumbling down flat. Mr. Yu cut at him right and left, each blow resounding like the watchman's wooden gong, and then, bringing a light, he found it was a wooden image, about as tall as a man. The bow and arrows were still there, the latter attached to its waist. Its carved and painted features were most hideous to behold, and wherever Mr. Yu had struck it with his sword, there was blood. Mr. Yu sat with the light in his hand till morning, when he awaked to the fact that all these devils had been sent by the necromancer in order to kill him, and so evidence his own magical power. 
The next day, after having told the story far and wide, he went with some others to the place where the necromancer had his stall, but the latter, seeing them coming, vanished in the twinkling of an eye. Someone observed that the blood of a dog would reveal a person who had made himself invisible, and Mr. Yu immediately procured some and went back with it. The necromancer disappeared as before, but on the spot where he had been standing they quickly threw down the dog's blood. Thereupon they saw his head and face all smeared over with blood, his eyes glaring like a devil's, and at once seizing him, they handed him over to the authorities, by whom he was put to death. Footnotes 1. Chong Zheng The last emperor of the Ming dynasty. He began to reign in A.D. 1628. 2. A necromancer in the marketplace. The trade of fortune-teller is one of the most flourishing in China. A large majority of the candidates who are unsuccessful at the public examinations devote their energies in this direction, and in every Chinese city there are regular establishments, whither the superstitious people repair to consult the oracle on every imaginable subject, not to mention hosts of itinerant soothsayers, both in town and country, whose stock in trade consists of a trestle table, pen, ink and paper, and a few other mysterious implements of their art. The nature of the response, favourable or otherwise, is determined by an inspection of the year, month, day and hour at which the applicant was born, taken in combination with other particulars referring to the question at issue. 3. Life and death are already fixed. A firm belief in predestination is an important characteristic of the Chinese mind. All is destiny is a phrase daily in the mouth of every man, woman and child in the empire. Confucius himself, we are told, objected to discourse to his disciples upon this topic, but it is evident from many passages in the Lunyu or Confucian Gospels, Book 6, Chapter 8, Book 14, Chapter 38, etc., that he believed in a certain prearrangement of human affairs, against which all efforts would be unavailing. 4. Clepsydra, an appliance of very ancient date in China, now superseded by cheap clocks and watches. A large clepsydra, consisting of four copper jars standing on steps one above the other, is still, however, to be seen in the city of Canton, and is in excellent working order, the night watches being determined by reference to its indicator in the lower jar. By its aid, coils of jostics, or pastille, are regulated to burn so many hours, and are sold to the poor, who use them both for the purpose of guiding their extremely vague notions of time, and for lighting the oft-recurring tobacco pipe. 5. A paper man. Paper men are a source of great dread to the people at large. During the year 1876, whole provinces were convulsed by the belief that some such superstitious agency was at work to deprive innocent persons of their tales, and the so-called Pope of the Taoist religion even went so far as to publish a charm against the machinations of the unseen. It ran as follows. Ye who urge filthy devils to spy out the people, the master's spirits are at hand and will soon discover you. With this charm, any one may travel by sunlight, moonlight or starlight all over the earth. At one time, popular excitement ran so high that serious consequences were anticipated, and the mandarins in the affected districts found it quite as much as they could do to prevent lynch law being carried out on harmless strangers who were unlucky enough to give rise to the slightest suspicion. Taoist priests are generally credited with the power of cutting out human, animal, or other figures, of infusing vitality into them on the spot, and of employing them for the purposes of good or evil. 6. The Watchman's Wooden Gong 
Watchmen in China, when on their nightly rounds, keep up an incessant beating on what, for want of a better term, we have called a wooden gong. The object is to let thieves know they are awake and on the lookout. End of Magical Arts Part 10 of A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Volume 1, Part 10. Joining the Immortals Read by David Barnes A Mr. Zhou of Wandung had in his youth been fellow-student with a Mr. Chung, and a firm friendship was the result. The latter was poor, and depended very much upon Mr. Zhou, who was the elder of the two. He called Mr. Zhou's wife his sister, and had the run of the house, just as if he was one of the family. Now this wife happening to die in childbed, Zhou married another named Wang, but as she was quite a young girl, Chung did not seek to be introduced. One day her younger brother came to visit her, and was being entertained in the inner apartments when Chung chanced to call. The servant announced his arrival, and Zhou bade him ask Mr. Chung in, but Chung would not enter and took his leave. Thereupon Zhou caused the entertainment to be moved into the public part of the house, and, sending after Chung, succeeded in bringing him back. They had hardly sat down before someone came in to say that a former servant of the establishment had been severely beaten at the magistrate's yamen, the facts of the case being that a cowboy of the Huang family, connected with the Board of Rights, had driven his cattle across the Zhou family's land and that words had arisen between the two servants in consequence, upon which the Huang family's servant had complained to his master, who had seized the other, and had sent him into the magistrates, where he had been bambooed. When Mr. Zhou found out what the matter was, he was exceedingly angry, and said, "'How dares this pig-boy fellow behave thus? Why, only a generation ago his master was my father's servant.' he emerges a little from his obscurity, and immediately thinks himself I don't know what. Swelling with rage, he rose to go in quest of Huang, but Chung held him back, saying, The age is corrupt, there is no distinction between right and wrong. Besides, the officials of the day are half of them thieves, and you will only get yourself in hot water. Zhou, however, would not listen to him, and it was only when tears were added to remonstrances that he consented to let the matter drop. But his anger did not cease, and he lay tossing and turning all night. In the morning he said to his family, I can stand the insults of Mr. Huang, but the magistrate is an officer of the government and not the servant of influential people. If there is a case of any kind, he should hear both plaintiff and defendant, and not act like a dog, biting anybody he's set upon. I will bring an action against the cowboy, and see what the magistrate will do to him. As his family rather egged him on, he accordingly proceeded to the magistrate, and entered a formal plaint. But that functionary tore up his petition, and would have nothing to do with it. This roused Joel's anger, and he told the magistrate plainly what he thought of him. In return for which contempt of court, he was at once seized and bound. During the forenoon, Mr. Chung called at his house, where he learnt that Joel had gone into the city to prosecute the cowboy, and immediately hurried after him with a view to stop proceedings. But his friend was already in the jail and all he could do was to stamp his foot in anger. Now it happened that three pirates had just been caught, and the magistrate and Huang, putting their heads together, bribed these fellows to say that Zhou was one of their gang. 
whereupon the higher authorities were petitioned to deprive him of his status as a graduate, and the magistrate then had him most unmercifully bambooed. Mr. Chung gained admittance to the jail, and after a painful interview proposed that a petition should be presented direct to the throne. Alas, said Zhou, here am I, bound and guarded like a bird in a cage. I have indeed a young brother, but it is as much as he can do to provide me with food. Then Chung stepped forward, saying, I will perform this service. Of what use are friends who will not assist in the hour of trouble? So away he went, and Joel's brother provided him with money to defray his expenses. After a long journey he arrived at the capital, where he found himself quite at a loss as to how he should get the petition presented. However, hearing that the emperor was about to set out on a hunting tour, he concealed himself in the market-place, and when his majesty passed by, prostrated himself on the ground with loud cries and gesticulations. The emperor received his petition, and sent it to the board of punishments, desiring to be furnished with a report on the case. It was then more than ten months since the beginning of the affair, and Joel, who had been made to confess to this false charge, was already under sentence of death, so that the officers of the board were very much alarmed when they received the imperial instructions, and set to work to rehear the case in person. Huang was also much alarmed, and devised a plan for killing Mr. Zhou by bribing the jailers to stop his food and drink so that when his brother brought provisions he was rudely thrust back and prevented from taking them in. Mr. Chung complained of this to the viceroy of the province, who investigated the matter himself, and found that Zhou was in the last stage of starvation, for which the jailers were bambooed to death. Terrified out of his wits, Huang, by dint of bribing heavily, succeeded in absconding and escaping a just punishment for his crimes. The magistrate, however, was banished for perversion of the law, and Zhou was permitted to return home, his affection for Chung being now very much increased. But ever after the prosecution and his friend's captivity, Mr. Chung took a dismal view of human affairs, and one day invited Zhou to retire with him from the world. The latter, who was deeply attached to his young wife, threw cold water on the proposition, and Mr. Chung pursued the subject no further, though his own mind was fully made up. Not seeing him for some days afterwards, Mr. Zhou sent to inquire after him at his house, but there they all thought he was at Zhou's, neither family, in fact, having seen anything of him. This looked suspicious, and Zhou, aware of his peculiarity, sent off people to look for him, bidding them search all the temples and monasteries in the neighbourhood. He also from time to time supplied Chung Son with money and other necessaries. Eight or nine years had passed away, when suddenly Chung reappeared, clad in a yellow cap and stole, and wearing the expression of a Taoist priest. Zhou was delighted, and seized his arm, saying, Where have you been, letting me search for you all over the place? The solitary cloud and the wild crane, replied Chung, laughing, have no fixed place of abode. Since we last met, my equanimity has happily been restored. Zhou then ordered wine, and they chatted together on what had taken place in the interval. He also tried to persuade Chung to detach himself from the Taoist persuasion, but the latter only smiled and answered nothing. It is absurd, argued Zhou. Why cast aside your wife and child as you would an old pair of shoes? Not so, answered Chung. If men wish to cast me aside, who is there who can do so now? Zhou asked where he lived, to which he replied, in the great pure mansion on Mount Lao. They then retired to sleep on the same bed, 
and by and by Joel dreamt that Chung was lying on his chest, so that he could not breathe. In a fright he asked him what he was doing, but got no answer, and then he waked up with a start. Calling to Chung, and receiving no reply, he sat up and stretched out his hand to touch him. The latter, however, had vanished, he knew not whither. When he got calm, he found he was lying at Chung's end of the bed, which rather alarmed him. I was not tipsy last night, reflected he. How could I have got over here? He next called his servants, and when they came and struck a light, lo, he was Chung. Now Zhou had had a beard, so he put up his hand to feel for it, but found only a few straggling hairs. He then seized a mirror to look at himself, and cried out in alarm, If this is Mr. Chung, where on earth am I? By this time he was wide awake, and knew that Chung had employed magic to induce him to retire from the world. He was on the point of entering the ladies' apartments, but his brother, not recognizing who he was, stopped him, and would not let him go in. And as he himself was unable to prove his own identity, he ordered his horse that he might go in search of Chung. After some days' journey he arrived at Mount Lao, and as his horse went along at a good rate the servant could not keep up with him. By and by he rested a while under a tree, and saw a great number of Taoist priests going backwards and forwards, and among them was one who stared fixedly at him. So he inquired of him where he should find Chung, whereat the priest laughed and said, I know the name, he is probably in the great pure mansion. When he had given this answer he went on his way, Zhou following him with his eyes about a stone's throw, until he saw him speak with someone else, and after saying a few words proceed onwards as before. The person whom he had spoken with came on to where Zhou was, and turned out to be a fellow townsman of his. He was much surprised at meeting Zhou, and said, I haven't seen you for some years. They told me you'd gone to Mount Lao to be a Taoist priest. How is it you are still amusing yourself among mortals? Zhou told him who he really was, upon which the other replied, Why, I thought the gentleman I just met was you. He has only just left me, and can't have got very far. Is it possible, cried Zhou, that I don't know my own face? Just then the servant came up, and away they went full speed, but could not discover the object of their search. All around them was a vast desert, and they were at a loss whether to go on or to return. But Joel reflected that he had no longer any home to receive him, and determined to carry out his design to the bitter end. But as the road was dangerous for riding, he gave his horse to the servant, and bade him to go back. On he went cautiously by himself, until he spied a boy sitting by the wayside alone. He hurried up to him, and asked the boy to direct him where he could find Mr. Chung. I am one of his disciples, replied the lad, and, shouldering Joel's bundle, started off to show the way. They journeyed on together, taking their food by the light of the stars and sleeping in the open air, until, after many miles of road, they arrived in three days at their destination. But this great pure locality was not like that generally spoken of in the world. Though as late as the middle of the tenth moon there was a great profusion of flowers along the road, quite unlike the beginning of winter, the lad went in and announced the arrival of a stranger, whereupon Mr. Chung came out, and Joe recognized his own features. Chung grasped his hand and led him inside, where he prepared wine and food, and they began to converse together. Joe noticed many birds of strange plumage, so tame that they were not afraid of him, and these from time to time would alight on the table and sing with voices like panpipes. He was very much astonished at all this, but a love of mundane pleasures had eaten at his soul, and he had no intention of stopping. 
On the ground were two rush mats, upon which Chung invited his friend to sit down with him. Then, about midnight, a serene calm stole over him, and while he was dozing off for a moment, he seemed to change places with Chung. Suspecting what had happened, he put his hand up to his chin, and found it covered with a beard as before. At dawn he was anxious to return home, but Chung pressed him to stay, and when three days had gone by, Chung said to him, I pray you take a little rest now. Tomorrow I will set you on your way. Zhou had barely closed his eyelids before he heard Chung calling out, Everything is ready for starting. So he got up and followed him along a road other than that by which he had come, and in a very short time he saw his home in the distance. In spite of Zhou's entreaties, Chung would not accompany him so far, but made Zhou go, waiting himself by the roadside. So the latter went alone, and when he reached his house, knocked at the door. Receiving no answer, he determined to go over the wall, when he found that his body was as light as a leaf, and with one spring he was over. In the same manner he passed several inner walls, until he reached the ladies' apartments, where he saw by the still burning lamp that the inmates had not yet retired for the night. Hearing people talking within, he licked a hole in the paper window and peeped through, and saw his wife sitting drinking with a most disreputable-looking fellow. Bursting with rage, his first impulse was to surprise them in the act, but seeing there were two against one, he stole away and let himself out by the entrance gate, hurrying off to Chung, to whom he related what he had seen, and finally begged his assistance. Chung willingly went along with him, and when they reached the room, Zhou seized a big stone and hammered loudly at the door. All was then confusion inside, so Zhou hammered again, upon which the door was barricaded more strongly than before. Here Chung came forward with his sword, and burst the door open with a crash. Zhou rushed in, and the man inside rushed out, but Chung was there, and with his sword cut his arm right off. Zhou rudely seized his wife, and asked what it all meant to which she replied that the man was a friend who sometimes came to take a cup of wine with them. Thereupon Zhou borrowed Chung's sword and cut off her head, hanging up the trunk on a tree in the courtyard. He then went back to Chung. By and by he awaked and found himself on the bed, at which he was somewhat disturbed, and said, I've had a strangely confused dream, which has given me a fright. My brother, replied Chung smilingly, you look upon dreams as realities, you mistake realities for dreams. Zhou asked what he meant by these words, and then Chung showed him his sword besmeared with blood. Zhou was terrified and sought to destroy himself, but all at once it occurred to him that Chung might be deceiving him again. Chung divined his suspicions, and made haste at once to see him home. In a little while they arrived at the village gate, and then Chung said, Was it not here, that, sword in hand, I awaited you that night? I cannot look upon the unclean spot. I pray you go on, and let me stay here. If you do not return by the afternoon, I will depart alone." Zhou then approached his house, which he found all shut up as if no one was living there, so he went in to his brothers. The latter, when he beheld Zhou, began to weep bitterly, saying, After your departure thieves broke into the house and killed my sister-in-law, hanging her body upon a tree. Alas, alas, the murderers have not yet been caught. Zhou then told him the whole story of his dream, and begged him to stop further proceedings, at all of which his brother was perfectly lost in astonishment. Zhou then asked after his son, and his brother told the nurse to bring him in, whereupon the former said, Upon this infant are centred the hopes of our race. Tend him well, 
for I am going to bid adieu to the world. He then took his leave, his brother following him all the time with tears in his eyes to induce him to remain, but he heeded him not, and when they reached the village gate his brother saw him go away with Chung. From afar he looked back and said, Forbear and be happy. His brother would have replied, but here Chung whisked his sleeve, and they disappeared. The brother remained there for some time, and then went back, overwhelmed with grief. He was an unpractical man, and before many years were over, all the property was gone and the family reduced to poverty. Zhou's son, who was growing up, was thus unable to secure the services of a tutor, and had no one but his uncle to teach him. One morning, on going into the schoolroom, the uncle found a letter lying on the desk addressed to himself in his brother's handwriting. There was, however, nothing in it but a fingernail about four inches in length. Surprised at this, he laid the nail down in the ink slab while he went out to ask whence this letter had come. This no one knew but when he went back he found that the inkstone had been changed into a piece of shining yellow gold. More than ever astonished, he tried the nail on copper and iron things, all of which were likewise turned to gold. He thus became very rich, sharing his wealth with Chung's son, and it was bruited about that the two families possessed the secret of transmutation. Footnotes. 1. Chung did not seek to be introduced. This is a characteristic touch. Only the most intimate of friends ever see each other's wives. 2. The inner apartments, where the women of the family live and into which no stranger ever penetrates. Among other names by which a Chinese husband speaks of his wife, a very common one is the inner woman. 3. The higher authorities were petitioned to deprive him of his status as a graduate, until which he would be safe, by virtue of his degree, from the degrading penalty of the bamboo. 4. The magistrate then had him most unmercifully bambooed. This is the instrument commonly used for flogging criminals in China, and consists of a strip of split bamboo planed down smooth. Strictly speaking, there are two kinds, the heavy and the light. The former is now hardly ever used. Until the reign of Kang Si, all strokes were given across the back, but that humane emperor removed the locus operandi further down, for fear of injuring the liver or the lungs. 5. The Board of Punishments one of the six boards, now seven, at the capital, equivalent to our own War Office, Board of Works, etc. 6. Made to confess to this false charge. It is a principle of Chinese jurisprudence that no sentence can be passed until the prisoner has confessed his guilt. A principle, however, frequently set aside in practice. 7. Paper window. Wooden frames covered with a semi-transparent paper are used all over the northern provinces of China. In the south, oyster shells cut square and planed down thin are inserted, tile fashion, in the long narrow spaces of a wooden frame made to receive them, and used for the same purpose. But glass is gradually finding its way into the houses of the well-to-do, large quantities being made at Canton and exported to various parts of the empire. 8. Sword. Every Taoist priest has a magic sword corresponding to our magician's wand. 9. Cut off her head. In China a man has the right to slay his adulterous wife, but he must slay her paramour also, both or neither. Otherwise he lays himself open to a prosecution for murder. The act completed, he is further bound to proceed at once to the magistrate of the district and report what he has done. 10. Upon this infant are centred the hopes of our race. 
the importance of male offspring in Chinese social life is hardly to be expressed in words. To the son is confided the task of worshipping at the ancestral tombs, the care of the ancestral tablets, and the due performance of all rites and ceremonies connected with the departed dead. No Chinaman will die, if he can help it, without leaving a son behind him. If his wife is childless, he will buy a concubine, and we are told on page 41, volume 8 of the Liao Jai, that a good wife, who at thirty years of age has not borne a child, should forthwith pawn her jewellery and purchase a concubine for her husband, for to be without a son is hard indeed. Another and a common resource is to adopt a nephew, and sometimes a boy is bought from starving parents or from a professional kidnapper. Should a little boy die, no matter how young, his parents do not permit even him to be without the good offices of a son. They adopt some other child on his behalf, and when the boy grows up it becomes his duty to perform the proper ceremonies at his baby father's tomb. Girls do not enjoy the luxury of this sham posterity. They are quietly buried in a hole near the family vault, and their disembodied spirits are left to wander about in the realms below, uncared for and unappeased. It must not be inferred, however, from this that the position of women in China is low, as such is far from being the case. Every mother shares in the ancestral worship, and her name is recorded on the tombstone, side by side with that of her husband. Hence it is that Chinese tombstones are always to the memory either of a father or of a mother, or of both, with occasionally the addition of the grandfather and grandmother, and sometimes even that of the generation preceding. 11. The Secret of Transmutation the belief that a knowledge of alchemy is obtainable by leading the life of a pure and perfect Taoist is one of the numerous additions in later ages to this ancient form of religion. End of Joining the Immortals Part 11 of A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling, translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Volume 1, Part 11, The Fighting Quails. Wang Cheng belonged to an old family in Ping Yuan, but was such an idle fellow that his property gradually disappeared until at length all he had left was an old tumble-down house. His wife and he slept under a coarse hempen coverlet, and the former was far from sparing her reproaches. At the time of which we are speaking the weather was unbearably hot, and Wang went to pass the night with many other of his fellow villagers in a pavilion which stood among some dilapidated buildings belonging to a family named Chow. With the first streaks of dawn his comrades departed, but Wang slept well on till about nine o'clock, when he got up and proceeded leisurely home. All at once he saw in the grass a gold hairpin, and taking it up to look at it, found engraved thereon in small characters the property of the imperial family. Now Wang's own grandfather had married into the imperial family, and consequently he had formerly possessed many similar articles but while he was thinking it over, up came an old woman in search of the hairpin, which Wang, who though poor was honest, at once produced and handed it to her. The old woman was delighted, and thanked Wang for his goodness, observing that the pin was not worth much in itself, but was a relic of her departed husband. Wang asked her what her husband had been, to which she replied, His name was Wang Qian Chi, and he was connected by marriage with the imperial family. "'My own grandfather!' cried Wang, in great surprise. "'How could you have known him?' "'You, then,' said the old woman, "'are his grandson. "'I am a fox, and many years ago I was married to your grandfather, "'but when he died I retired from the world. "'Passing by here I lost my hairpin, "'which destiny conveyed into your hands.' 
Wang had heard of his grandfather's fox wife, and believing therefore the old woman's story, invited her to return with him, which she did. Wang called his wife out to receive her, but when she came in rags and tatters, with unkempt hair and dirty face, the old woman sighed and said, Alas, alas, has Wang Chien Chi's grandson come to this? Then looking at the broken, smokeless stove, she added, How, under these circumstances, have you managed even to support life? Here Wang's wife told the tale of their poverty, with much sobbing and tears, whereupon the old woman gave her the hairpin, bidding her go pawn it, and with the proceeds buy some food, saying that in three days she would visit them again. Wang pressed her to stay, but she said, You can't even keep your wife alive. What would it benefit you to have me also dependent on you? So she went away, and then Wang told his wife who she was, at which his wife felt very much alarmed. But Wang was so loud in her praises that finally his wife consented to treat her with all proper respect. In three days she returned as agreed, and, producing some money, sent out for a hundred weight of rice and a hundred weight of corn. She passed the night with them, sleeping with Mrs. Wang, who was at first rather frightened, but who soon laid aside her suspicions when she found that the old lady meant so well towards them. Next day the latter addressed Wang, saying, My grandson, you must not be so lazy. You should try to make a little money in some way or another. Wang replied that he had no capital, upon which the old lady said, When your grandfather was alive, he allowed me to take what money I liked, but not being a mortal, I had no use for it, and consequently did not draw largely upon him. I have, however, saved from my pin money the sum of forty ounces of silver, which has long been lying idle for want of an investment. Take it, and buy summer cloth, which you may carry to the capital and resell at a profit. So Wang bought some fifty pieces of summer cloth, and the old lady made him get ready, calculating that in six or seven days he would reach the capital. She also warned him, saying, Be neither lazy nor slow, for if a day too long you wait, repentance comes a day too late. Wang promised all obedience, and packed up his goods and went off. On the road he was overtaken by a rainstorm which soaked him through to the skin, and as he was not accustomed to be out in bad weather, it was altogether too much for him. He accordingly sought shelter at an inn, but the rain went on steadily till night, running over the eaves of the house like so many ropes. Next morning the roads were in a horrible state, and Wang, watching the passers-by slipping about in the slush, unable to see any path, dared not face it all, and remained until noon, when it began to dry up a little. Just then, however, the clouds closed over again, and down came the rain in torrents, causing him to stay another night before he could go on. When he was nearing the capital, he heard to his great joy that summer cloth was at a premium, and on arrival proceeded at once to take up his quarters at an inn. There the landlord said it was a pity he had come so late, as communications with the south having been only recently opened, the supply of summer cloth had been small, and there being a great demand for it among the wealthy families of the metropolis, its price had gone up to three times the usual figure. But, he added, two days ago several large consignments arrived, and the price went down again, so that the late comers have lost their market. Poor Wang was thus left in the lurch, and as every day more summer cloth came in, the value of it fell in a corresponding ratio. Wang would not part with his at a loss, and held on for some ten days, when his expenses for board and lodging were added to his present distress. The landlord urged him to sell even at a loss, and turn his attention to something else, which he ultimately did, losing over ten ounces of silver on his venture. Next day he rose in the morning to depart, but on looking in his purse found all his money gone. He rushed away to tell the landlord, who, however, could do nothing for him. Some one then advised him to take out a summons and make the landlord reimburse him, but he only sighed and said, It is my destiny and no fault of the landlord's. Thereupon the landlord was very grateful to him and gave him five ounces of silver to enable him to go home. He did not care, however, to face his grandmother empty-handed and remained in a very undecided state until suddenly he saw a quail-catcher winning heaps of money by fighting his birds 
and selling them at over a hundred cash apiece. He then determined to lay out his five ounces of silver in quails, and pay back the landlord out of the profits. The latter approved very highly of this plan, and not only agreed to lend him a room, but also to charge him little or nothing for his board. So Wang went off rejoicing, and bought two large baskets of quails, with which he returned to the city, to the great satisfaction of the landlord, who advised him to lose no time in disposing of them. All that night it poured in torrents, and the next morning the streets were like rivers, the rain still continuing to fall. Wang waited for it to clear up, but several days passed, and still there were no signs of fine weather. He then went to look at his quails, some of which he found dead and others dying. He was much alarmed at this, but was quite at a loss what to do, and by the next day a lot more had died, so that only a few were left, which he fed all together in one basket. The day after this he went again to look at them, and lo, there remained but a single quail. With tears in his eyes he told the landlord what had happened, and he too was much affected. Wang then reflected that he had no money left to carry him home, and that he could not do better than cease to live. But the landlord spoke to him and soothed him, and they went together to look at the quail. This is a fine bird, said the landlord, and it strikes me that it has simply killed the others. Now, as you have got nothing to do, just set to work and train it, and if it is good for anything, why, you'll be able to make a living out of it. Wang did as he was told, and when the bird was trained, the landlord bade him take it into the street and gamble for something to eat. This, too, he did, and his quail won every main, whereupon the landlord gave him some money to bet with the young fellows of the neighborhood. Everything turned out favorably, and by the end of six months he had saved twenty ounces of silver, so that he became quite easy in his mind, and looked upon the quail as a dispensation of his destiny. Now one of the princes was passionately fond of quail fighting, and always at the feast of lanterns anybody who owned quails might go and fight them in the palace against the prince's birds. The landlord therefore said to Wang, Here is a chance of enriching yourself by a single stroke, only I can't say what your luck will do for you. He then explained to him what it was, and away they went together, the landlord saying, If you lose, burst out into lamentations, but if you are lucky enough to win, and the prince wishes, as he will, to buy your bird, don't consent. If he presses you very much, watch for a nod from me before you agree. This settled, they proceeded to the palace, where they found crowds of quail fighters already on the ground, and then the prince came forth, heralds proclaiming to the multitude that any who wished to fight their birds might come up. Some man at once stepped forward, and the prince gave orders for the quails to be released, but at the first strike the stranger's quail was knocked out of time. The prince smiled, and by and by won several more mains, until at last the landlord said, Now's our time, and went up together with Wang. The prince looked at their bird and said, It has a fierce-looking eye and strong feathers. We must be careful what we are doing. So he commanded his servants to bring out Iron Beak to oppose Wang's bird. But after a couple of strikes, the prince's quail was signally defeated. He sent for a better bird, but that shared the same fate, and then he cried out, Bring the jade bird from the palace. In a little time it arrived, with pure white feathers like an egret, and an unusually martial appearance. Wang was much alarmed, and falling on his knees, prayed to be excused this mane, saying, Your highness's bird is too good. I fear lest mine should be wounded, and my livelihood be taken from me. But the prince laughed and said, Go on, if your quail is killed, I will make it up to you handsomely. Wang then released his bird, and the prince's quail rushed at it at once. But when the jade bird was close by, Wang's quail awaited its coming head down and full of rage. The former made a violent peck at its adversary, and then sprang up to swoop down on it. Thus they went on up and down, backwards and forwards, until at length they got a hold of each other, and the prince's bird was beginning to show signs of exhaustion. This enraged it all the more, and it fought more violently than ever, but soon a perfect snowstorm of feathers began to fall, and, with drooping wings, the jade bird made its escape. The spectators were much moved by the result, and the prince himself, taking up Wang's bird, examined it closely from beak to claws, finally asking if it was for sale. 
My sole dependence, replied Wang, is upon this bird. I would rather not part with it. But, said the prince, if I give you as much as the capital, say, of an ordinary tradesman, will that not tempt you? Wang thought some time, and then answered, I would rather not sell my bird, but as your highness has taken a fancy to it, I will only ask enough to find me in food and clothes. How much do you want? inquired the prince, to which Wang replied that he would take a thousand ounces of silver. You fool! cried the prince. Do you think your bird is such a jewel as all that? If your highness, says Wang, does not think the bird a jewel, I value it more than that stone which was priced at fifteen cities. How so? asked the prince. Why, said Wang, I take my bird every day into the marketplace. It there wins for me several ounces of silver, which I exchange for rice. My family, over ten in number, has nothing to fear from either cold or hunger. What jewel could do that? You shall not lose anything, replied the prince. I will give you two hundred ounces. But Wang would not consent, and then the prince added another hundred, whereupon Wang looked at the landlord, who, however, made no sign. Wang then offered to take nine hundred, but the prince ridiculed the idea of paying such a price for a quail, and Wang was preparing to take his leave with the bird, when the prince called him back, saying, Here, here, I will give you six hundred, take it or leave it as you please. Wang here looked at the landlord, and the landlord remained motionless as before. However, Wang was satisfied himself with this offer, and being afraid of missing his chance, said to his friend, If I get this price for it, I shall be quite content. If we go on haggling and finally come to no terms, that will be a very poor end to it all. So he took the prince's offer, and the latter, overjoyed, caused the money to be handed to him. Wang then returned with his earnings, but the landlord said to him, What did I say to you? You were in too much of a hurry to sell. Another minute, and you would have got eight hundred. When Wang got back, he threw the money on the table and told the landlord to take what he liked. But the latter would not, and it was only after some pressing that he would accept payment for Wang's board. Wang then packed up and went home, where he told his story and produced his silver to the great delight of all of them. The old lady counseled the purchase of a quantity of land, the building of a house, and the purchase of implements and in a very short time they became a wealthy family. The old lady always got up early in the morning and made Wang attend to the farm, his wife to her spinning, and rated them soundly at any signs of laziness. The husband and wife henceforth lived in peace and no longer abused each other, until at the expiration of three years the old lady declared her intention of bidding them adieu. They both tried to stop her, and with the aid of tears succeeded in persuading her, but the next day she had disappeared. Footnotes 1. Wang's own grandfather had married into the imperial family. The direct issue of the emperors of the present dynasty and their descendants in the male line forever are entitled to wear a yellow girdle in token of their relationship to the imperial family, each generation becoming a degree lower in rank, but always retaining this distinctive badge. Members of the collateral branches wear a red girdle, and are commonly known as gioros. With the lapse of two hundred and fifty years, the wearers of these badges have become numerous, and in many cases disreputable, and they are now to be found even among the lowest dregs of Chinese social life. 2. Quail fighting is not so common now in China as it appears to have been formerly. Cricket fighting is, however, a very favorite form of gambling, large quantities of these insects being caught every year for this purpose, and considerable sums frequently staked on the result of a contest between two champions. End of The Fighting Quails Part 12 of Selection from Strange Stories from Chinese Studio Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A selection from Strange Stories from Chinese Studio by Pu Shongling, translated by Harvey Orange Isles. Volume 1, Part 2 The Painted Skin, read by Vivian Chen, March 2008, in Guangzhou, China. A Taiyuan, the little man who named Wang, 
one morning he was out working when he met a young lady carrying a bundle and hurrying along by herself as she moved along with some difficulty wang quickened his pace and caught her up and found she was a very pretty girl of about sixteen maud smitten he inquired whether she was going so early and no one with her a traveller like you replied the girl cannot alleviate my distress why trouble yourself to ask what distress is it said one i am sure i will do anything i can for you my parents answered she loved money and they saw me as a concubine into a rich family where the wife was very jealous and beat and abused me morning and night it was more than i could stand so i had to run away wang asked where she was going to which she replied that a runaway had no fixed place or adobe my house said one is at no great distance what do you say come in there she joyfully acquiesced and one taking up her bundle led the way to his house finding no one there she asked one where his family were to which he replied that that was only the library a very nice place too said she but you you are kind enough to save my life you mustn't let anyone know that i am here one promised he would not divulge her secret and so she remained there for some days without anyone knowing anything about it he then told his wife and she fearing the girl might belong to some inferential family advised him to send her away this however he would not consent to do when one day going into the town he met a taoist priest who looked at him in astonishment and asked him what he had met i have met nothing replied one why you are bewitched said the priest what do you mean by not having met anything but wang insisted that it was so and the priest walked away saying that fool some people don't seem to know when death is at hand this startled wang whom at first thought of the girl but then he reflected that a pretty young thing as she was wouldn't well be a witch and began to suspect that the priest merely wanted to make a stroke of business when he returned the library door was shut and he couldn't get in which made him suspect that something was wrong and so he climbed over the wall where he found the door of the inner room shut too softly creeping up he looked through the window and saw a hideous devil with a green face and a jagged tooth like a saw spreading a human skin upon the bed and painting it with a paintbrush the devil then threw aside the brush and giving the skin a shake out just like you would a cold threw it over its shoulders when well, lo it was the girl terrified at this wang hurried away with his head down in search for the priest who had gone he knew not whither subsequently finding in the fields where he threw himself on his knees and begged the priest to save him as to driving her away said the priest the creature must be in great distress to be seeking a substitute for herself besides i could hardly endure to injure a living thing however he gave one a fry brush and begged him to hang it at the door of the bedroom agreeing to meet again at the qing di temple wang went home but did not die enter the library so he hung up the brush at the bedroom door and before long heard a sound of footsteps outside not daring to move he made his wife peep out and she saw the girl standing looking at the brush afraid to pass it she then ground her teeth and went away but in a little while came back and began cursing saying you praised you don't frighten me do you think i'm going to get up 
was already in my grip thereupon she tore the brush into pieces and bursting open the door walked straight up to the bed where she read open one and tore out his heart with which she went away wang's wife screamed out and the servant came in with a light but wang was already dead and present a most miserable spectacle his wife who was in an agony of fright hardly tried cry for fear of making a noise and next day she sent wang's brother to see the priest the latter got into a great rage and cried out was it for this that i have compassion on you devil that you are proceeding at once with one's brother to the house from which the girl had disappeared without any one knowing whither she had gone but the priest raising his head looked around and said luckily she is not far away he then asked who had lived in the apartment to the south side to which one's brother replied that he did whereupon the priest declared that that she would be found one's brother was horribly frightened and said he did not think so and then the priest asked him if any stranger had been to the house to this he answered that he had been out to the tindi temple and could not possibly say but he went out to inquire and in a little while came back and reported that an old woman had sought service with them as a maid of all work and had been engaged by his wife that is she said the priest as one's brother added she was still there and they all set out to go to the house together then the priest took his wooden sword and standing in the middle of the courtyard shouted out base bone friend give me back my fly brush meanwhile the new maid of all work was in a great state of alarm and tried to get away by the door but the priest struck her and down she fell flat the human skin dropped off and she became a hideous devil there she lay grouting like a pig until the priest grabbed his wooden sword and struck off her head she then became a dense curl of smoke curling up from the ground when the priest took an uncalled guard and threw it right into the midst of the smoke a sucking noise was heard and the whole current was drawn into the ground out of which the priest cocked it up closely and put it in his pouch the skin too which was complete even to the eyebrows eyes hands and feet he also rolled up as if it had been a scroll and was on the point of leaving with it when one's wife stopped in and with tears entreated him to bring her husband to life the priest said he was unable to do that but one's wife flung herself at his feet and with loud lamentations implored his assistance for some time he remained immersed in thought and then replied my power is not equal to what you asked i myself cannot raise the dead but i will direct you to some one who can and if you apply to him properly you will succeed one's wife asked the priest who it was to which he replied there is a maniac in the town who passes his time grovelling in the dirt go prostrate yourself before him and beg him to help you if he insults you show no sign of anger one's brother knew the man to whom he alluded and accordingly bade the priest adieu and proceeded thither with his sister-in-law they found the destitute creature raving away by the roadside so filthy that it was all they could do to go near him one's wife approached him on her knees at which the many leered at her and cried out eh, do you love me my beauty one's wife told him what she had come for but he only laughed and said you can get plenty of other husbands why raise the dead one to life but one's wife entreated him to help her whereupon he observed it is very strange 
people apply to me to raise their dead as if i was kind of the infernal regions he then gave wang's wife a threshing with his staff which she bore without a murmur and before gradually increasing crowd of spectators after this he produced a loathsome pill which he told her she must swallow but here she broke down and was quite unable to do so however she did manage it at last and then the maniac crying out how you do love me got up and went away without taking any more notice of her they followed him into a temple with loud supplications but he had disappeared and every effect to find him was unsuccessful overcome with raging shame wang's wife went home where she mourned bitterly over her dead husband grievously repenting the steps she had taken and wished only to die she then bethought herself of preparing the corpse near which none of the servants would venture and set to work closing up the frightful wound at which he died while thus employed interrupted from time to time by her sobs she felt a raging lump in her throat which by and by came out with a pop and fell straight into the dead man's wound looking closely at it she saw it was a human heart and then it began as it were to throb emitting a warm vapor like smoke much excited she was at once crossed the fresh over it and hold the sides of the wound together with all her might very soon however she got tired and fighting the vampires escaping from the quavers she tore out a piece of silk and bowed it round at the same time bringing back circulation by rubbing the body and covering up with clothes in the night she removed the coverings and found that the breathing was coming from the nose and by next morning her husband was alive again though disturbed in mind as if awakened from a dream and feeling a pain in his heart where he had been wounded there was a secretary about as big as a cash which soon after disappeared such knows wang as she moved along with some difficulty impeded of course by her bowed feet this practice is said to have originated about a d nine seventy with yonian the concubine of the pretender li yu who wished to make her fee like the new moon the manchu or dadang ladies never adopted this custom and therefore the empresses of the modern time have had feed of the natural size neither is it in force among the hard castes or among the field tribes of china or for more thumbs and others the practice was forbidden in 1664 by the manchu emperor kang si but popular feeling was so strong on the subject that four years afterwards the provision was withdrawn a vigorous attempt is now being made to secure a natural fee for chinese girl with more chance of success two the creature must be in great distress to be seeking a substitute for herself the disembodied spirits of the chinese inferno are permitted under certain conditions of time and good conduct to appropriate themselves to the vitality of some human beings who as it were exchange places with the so-called devil the devil does not however reappears as the moral whose life it has become possessed of but is merely born again into the world the idea being that the amount of life on earth is a constant quantity and cannot be increased or diminished reminding one in a way of the great modern doctrine of the conservation of energy this curious belief has an important bearing that will be brought out in a subsequent story three i could hardly endure to injure a living thing here again is a Taoist priest quoting the bullish commandment thou shalt not take life 
the buddhist lady in china who do not hesitate to take life for the purpose of food solve their conscience from time to time by buying birds fishes etc and letting them go in the hope that such as will be set down on the credit side of their records of good and evil for a sucking nose was heard and the whole column was drawn into the ground after which the priest caught it up closely and put it into his pouch this recalls the celebrated story of the fishman in the arabian nights End of the pentaskin Part 13 of A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Sung Ling. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Volume 1, Part 13, The Trader's Son. Read by Scott Carpenter. In the province of Hunan there dwelt a man who was engaged in trading abroad, and his wife, who lived alone, dreamt one night that someone was in her room. Waking up she looked about and discovered a small creature which on examination she knew to be a fox, but in a moment the thing had disappeared although the door had not been opened. The next evening she asked the cookmaid to come and keep her company, as also her own son, a boy of ten who was accustomed to sleep elsewhere. Towards the middle of the night, when the cook and the boy were fast asleep, back came the fox, and the cook was woken up by hearing her mistress muttering something as if she had nightmare. The former then called out, and the fox ran away. But from that moment the trader's wife was not quite herself. When night came, she dared not blow out the candle, and bade her son to be sure and not sleep too soundly. Later on, her son and the old woman, having taken a nap as they leant against the wall, suddenly woke up and found her gone. They waited some time, but she did not return, and the cook was too frightened to go and look after her, so her son took a light, and at length found her fast asleep in another room. She didn't seem aware that anything particular had happened, but she became queerer and queerer every day, and wouldn't have either her son or the cook to keep her company any more. Her son, however, made a point of running at once into his mother's room if he heard any unusual sounds, and though his mother always abused him for his pains, he paid no attention to what she said. Consequently, everyone thought him very brave, though at the same time he was always indulging in childish tricks. One day he played at being a mason and piled up stones upon the window sill, in spite of all that was said to him, and if anyone took away a stone he threw himself on the ground and cried like a child, so that nobody dared go near him. In a few days he had got both windows blocked up and the light excluded, and then he set to filling up the chinks with mud. He worked hard all day without minding the trouble, and when it was finished he took and sharpened the kitchen chopper. Everyone who saw him was disgusted with such antics, and would take no notice of him. At night he darkened his lamp, and with a knife concealed on his person, sat waiting for his mother to mutter. As soon as she began he uncovered his light, and blocking up the doorway shouted out at the top of his voice. Nothing, however, happened and he moved from the door a little way, when suddenly out rushed something like a fox, which was disappearing through the door when he made a quick movement and cut off about two inches of its tail, from which the warm blood was still dripping as he brought the light to bear upon it. His mother hereupon cursed and reviled him, but he pretended not to hear her, regretting only as he went to bed that he hadn't hit the brute fair. But he consoled himself by thinking that although he hadn't killed it outright, he had done enough to prevent it coming again, on the morrow, he followed the tracks of blood over the wall and into the garden of a family named Ho, and that night, to his great joy, the fox did not reappear. His mother was meanwhile prostrate with hardly any life in her, and in the midst of it all his father came home. The boy told him what had happened, at which he was much alarmed and sent for a doctor to attend his wife, but she only threw the medicine away and cursed and swore horribly. So they secretly mixed the medicine with her tea and soup, and in a few days she began to get better, to the inexpressible delight of both her husband and son. 
One night, however, her husband woke up and found her gone, and after searching for her with the aid of his son, they discovered her sleeping in another room. From that time she became more eccentric than ever, and was always being found in strange places, cursing those who tried to remove her. Her husband was at his wit's end. It was of no use keeping the door locked, for it opened of itself at her approach, and he had called in any number of magicians to exorcise the fox, but without obtaining the slightest result. One evening her son concealed himself in the Ho family garden, and laid down in the long grass with a view to detecting the fox's retreat. As the moon rose he heard the sound of voices, and pushing aside the grass saw two people drinking, with a long-bearded servant pouring out their wine, dressed in an old dark brown coat. They were whispering together, and he could not make out what they said, but by and by he heard one of them remark, Get some white wine for tomorrow. And then they went away, leaving the long-bearded servant alone. The latter then threw off his coat and lay down to sleep on the stones, whereupon the trader's son eyed him carefully, and saw that he was like a man in every respect, except that he had a tail. The boy would then have gone, but he was afraid the fox might hear him, and accordingly remained where he was till near dawn, when he saw the other two come back, one at a time, and then they all disappeared among the bushes. On reaching home his father asked him where he had been, and he replied that he had stopped the night with the Ho family. He then accompanied his father to the town, where he saw hanging up at a hat shop a fox's tail, and finally, after much coaxing, succeeded in making his father buy it for him. While the latter was engaged in a shop, his son, who was playing about beside him, availed himself of a moment when his father was not looking and stole some money from him, and went off and bought a quantity of white wine, which he left in charge of the wine merchant. Now an uncle of his, who was a sportsman by trade, lived in the city, and thither he next betook himself. His uncle was out, but his aunt was there, and inquired after the health of his mother. "'She has been better the last few days,' replied he. "'but she is now very much upset by a rat having gnawed a dress of hers, "'and has sent me to ask for some poison. "'His aunt opened the cupboard, and gave him about the tenth of an ounce in a piece of paper, "'which he thought was very little, so when his aunt had gone to get him something to eat, "'he took the opportunity of being alone, opened the packet, and abstracted a large handful. "'Hiding this in his coat, he ran to tell his aunt that she needn't prepare anything for him, "'as his father was waiting in the market, and he couldn't stop to eat it.' He then went off, and having quietly dropped the poison into the wine he had bought, went sauntering about the town. At nightfall he returned home, and told his father that he had been at his uncle's. This he continued to do for some time, until one day he saw among the crowd his long-bearded friend. Marking him closely, he followed him, and at length entered into conversation, asking him where he lived. "'I live at Pai Tsun, he said. "'Where do you live?' I, replied the trader's son falsely, live in a hole on the hillside. The long-bearded man was considerably startled at his answer, but much more so when he added, We've lived there for generations, haven't you? The other man asked his name, to which the boy replied, My name is Hu. I saw you with two gentlemen in the Ho family garden, and I haven't forgotten you. Questioning him more fully, the long-bearded man was still in a half-and-half -half state of belief and doubt, when the trader's son opened his coat a little bit, and showed him the end of the tail he had bought, saying, The like of us can mix with ordinary people, but unfortunately we can never get rid of this. The long-bearded man then asked him what he was doing there, to which he answered that his father had sent him to buy wine. Thereupon the former remarked that that was exactly what he had come for, and the boy then inquired if he had bought it yet or not. We are poor, replied the stranger, and as a rule I prefer to steal it. A difficult and dangerous job, observed the boy. I have my master's instructions to get some, said the other, and what am I to do? The boy then asked him who his masters were, to which he replied that they were the two brothers the boy had seen that night. One of them has bewitched a lady named Wang, and the other the wife of a trader who lives near. The son of the last-mentioned lady is a violent fellow, and cut off my master's tail, so that he was laid up for ten days. But he is putting her under spells again now. He was then going away, saying he should never get his wine, but the boy said to him, It's much easier to buy than steal. I have some at the wine shop there which I will give to you. My purse isn't empty, and I can buy some more. The long-bearded man hardly knew how to thank him, but the boy said, We're all one family, don't mention such a trifle. When I have time I'll come and take a drink with you. 
So they went off together to the wine shop, where the boy gave him the wine, and they then separated. That night his mother slept quietly and had no fits, and the boy knew that something must have happened. He then told his father, and they went to see if there were any results, when, lo, they found both foxes stretched out dead in the arbor. One of the foxes was lying on the grass, and out of its mouth blood was still trickling. The wine bottle was there, and on shaking it they heard that some was left. Then his father asked him why he had kept it all so secret, to which the boy replied that foxes were very sagacious, and would have been sure to scent the plot. Thereupon his father was mightily pleased, and said he was a perfect Ulysses for cunning. They then carried the foxes home, and saw on the tail of one of them the scar of a knife wound. From that time they were left in peace, but the trader's wife became very thin, and though her reason returned, she shortly afterwards died of consumption. The other lady, Mrs. Wang, began to get better as soon as the foxes had been killed. And as to the boy, he was taught riding and archery by his proud parent, and subsequently rose to high rank in the army. Footnotes 1. My name is Hu. Hu is the sound of the character for fox. It is also the sound of quite a different character, which is used as a surname. 2. Ulysses. The name of the Chinese type was Chen Ping. 3. Archery. Skill in archery was until quite lately de rigueur for all Manchus, and for those who would rise in the Chinese army. End of The Traitor's Son Part 14 of A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Sung Ling. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Volume 1, Part 14. Judge Lu, read by Scott Carpenter. At Ling Yang there lived a man named Chu Ertan, whose literary designation was Xiao Ming. He was a fine, manly fellow, but an egregious dunce, though he tried hard to learn. One day he was taking wine with a number of fellow students, when one of them said to him, by way of a joke, People credit you with plenty of pluck. Now, if you will go in the middle of the night to the Chamber of Horrors and bring back the infernal judge from the left-hand porch, we'll stand you a dinner. For at Ling Yang there was a representation of the ten courts of purgatory, with the gods and devils carved in wood and almost lifelike in appearance. And in the eastern vestibule there was a full-length image of the judge with a green face and a red beard and a hideous expression in his features. Sometimes sounds of examination under the whip were heard to issue during the night from both porches, and persons who went in found their hair standing on end from fear. So the other young men thought it would be a capital test for Mr. Chu. Thereupon Chu smiled, and rising from his seat went straight off to the temple, and before many minutes had elapsed they heard him shouting outside, His Excellency has arrived! At this they all got up, and in came Chu with the image on his back, which he proceeded to deposit on the table, and then poured out a triple libation in its honor. His comrades, who were watching what he did, felt ill at ease, and did not like to resume their seats. So they begged him to carry the judge back again. But he first poured some wine upon the ground, invoking the image as follows. I am only a foolhardy, illiterate fellow. I pray, Your Excellency, excuse me. My house is close by, and whenever Your Excellency feels so disposed, I shall be glad to take a cup of wine with you in a friendly way. He then carried the judge back, and the next day his friends gave him the promised dinner, from which he went home half tipsy in the evening. But not feeling that he had had enough, he brightened up his lamp and helped himself to another cup of wine, when suddenly the bamboo curtain was drawn aside, and in walked the judge. Mr. Chu got up and said, Oh dear, your excellency has come to cut off my head for my rudeness the other night. The judge parted his thick beard and smiling replied, Nothing of the kind. You kindly invited me last night to visit you. And as I have leisure this evening, here I am. 
Chu was delighted at this and made his guest sit down while he himself wiped the cups and lighted a fire. It's warm weather, said the judge. Let's drink the wine cold. Chu obeyed and, putting the bottle on the table, went out to tell his servants to get some supper. His wife was much alarmed when she heard who was there and begged him not to go back. But he only waited until the things were ready and then returned with them. They drank out of each other's cups, and by and by Chu asked the name of his guest. My name is Lu, replied the judge. I have no other names. They then conversed on literary subjects, one capping the other's quotation as echo responds to sound. The judge then asked Chu if he understood composition, to which he answered that he could just tell good from bad, whereupon the former repeated a little infernal poetry which was not very different from that of mortals. He was a deep drinker and took off ten goblets at a draught, but Chu, who had been at it all day, soon got dead drunk and fell fast asleep with his head on the table. When he woke up, the candle had burnt out and the day was beginning to break, his guest having already departed, and from this time the judge was in the habit of dropping in pretty often until a close friendship sprang up between them. Sometimes the latter would pass the night at the house and Chu would show him his essays, all of which the judge scored and underlined as being good for nothing. One night, Chu got tipsy and went to bed first, leaving the judge drinking by himself. In his drunken sleep, he seemed to feel a pain in his stomach, and waking up he saw that the judge, who was standing by the side of the bed, had opened him and was carefully arranging his inside. "'What harm have I done you?' cried Chu, "'that you should thus seek to destroy me.' Don't be afraid, replied the judge, laughing. I am only providing you with a more intelligent heart. He then quietly put back Chu's viscera and closed up the opening, securing it with a bandage tied tightly round his waist. There was no blood on the bed, and all Chu felt was a slight numbness in his inside. Here he observed the judge place a piece of flesh upon the table and asked him what it was. Your heart, said the latter which wasn't at all good at composition, the proper orifice being stuffed up. I have now provided you with a better one, which I procured from Hades, and I am keeping yours to put in its place. He then opened the door and took his leave. In the morning, Chu undid the bandage and looked at his waist, the wound on which had quite healed up, leaving only a red seam. From that moment he became an apt scholar and found his memory much improved, so much so that a few days afterwards he showed an essay to the judge for which he was very much commended. However, said the latter, your success will be limited to the master's degree. You won't get beyond that. When shall I take it? asked Chu. This year, replied the judge. And so it turned out. Chu passed first on the list for the bachelor's degree, and then among the first five for the master's degree. His old comrades, who had been accustomed to make a laughing stock of him, were now astonished to find him a full-blown M.A., and when they learned how it had come about, they begged Chu to speak to the judge on their behalf. The judge promised to assist them, and they made all ready to receive him, but when in the evening he did come, they were so frightened at his red beard and flashing eyes that their teeth chattered in their heads, and one by one they stole away. Chu then took the judge home with him to have a cup together, and when the wine had mounted well into his head, he said, I'm deeply grateful to your excellency's former kindness in arranging my inside, but there is still another favor I venture to ask, which possibly may be granted. The judge asked him what it was, and Chu replied, if you can change a person's inside, you surely could also change his face. Now, my wife is not at all a bad figure, but she is very ugly. I pray, Your Excellency, try the knife upon her. The judge laughed and said he would do so, only it would be necessary to give him a little time. Some days subsequently, the judge knocked at Chu's door toward the middle of the night, whereupon the latter jumped up and invited him in. Lighting a candle, it was evident that the judge had something under his coat, and in answer to Chu's inquiries he said, It's what you ask me for. 
I have had great trouble in procuring it. He then produced the head of a nice-looking young girl and presented it to Chu, who found the blood on the neck was still warm. We must make haste, said the judge, and take care not to wake the fowls or dogs. Chu was afraid his wife's door might be bolted, but the judge laid his hand on it and it opened at once. Chu then led him to the bed where his wife was lying asleep on her side, and the judge, giving Chu the head to hold, drew from his boot a steel blade shaped like the handle of a spoon. He laid this across the lady's neck, which he cut through as if it had been a melon, and the head fell over the back of the pillow. Seizing the head he had brought with him, he now fitted it on carefully and accurately, and pressing it down to make it stick, bolstered the lady up with pillows placed on either side. When all was finished, he bade Chu put his wife's old head away, and then took his leave. Soon after, Mrs. Chu waked up and perceived a curious sensation about her neck and scaly feeling about the jaws. Putting her hand to her face, she found flakes of dry blood, and much frightened called a maidservant to bring water to wash it off. The maidservant was also greatly alarmed at the appearance of her face, and proceeded to wash off the blood which colored a whole basin of water, but when she saw her mistress's new face she was almost frightened to death. Mrs. Chu took a mirror to look at herself and was staring at herself in utter astonishment when her husband came in and explained what had taken place. On examining her more closely, Chu saw she had a well-featured, pleasant face of a high order of beauty, and when he came to look at her neck he found a red seam all round, with the parts above and below of a different colored flesh. Now the daughter of a young official named Wu was a very nice-looking girl, who, though nineteen years of age, had not yet been married, two gentlemen who were engaged to her having died before the day. At the Feast of Lanterns this young lady happened to visit the Chamber of Horrors, whence she was followed home by a burglar, who that night broke into the house and killed her. Hearing a noise, her mother told the servant to go and see what was the matter, and the murder being thus discovered, every member of the family got up. They placed the body in the hall, with the head alongside, and gave themselves up to weeping and wailing the live-long night. Next morning, when they removed the coverings, the corpse was there, but the head had disappeared. The waiting-maids were accordingly flogged for neglect of duty and consequent loss of the head and Mr. Wu brought the matter to the notice of the prefect. This officer took very energetic measures, but for three months no clue could be obtained, and then the story of the changed head in the Chu family gradually reached Mr. Wu's ears. Suspecting something, he sent an old woman to make inquiries, and she at once recognized her late young mistress's features and went back and reported to her master. Thereupon Mr. Wu, unable to make out why the body should have been left, imagined that Chu had slain his daughter by magical arts, and at once proceeded to the house to find out the truth of the matter. But Chu told him that his wife's head had been changed in her sleep, and that he knew nothing about it, adding that it was unjust to accuse him of the murder. Mr. Wu refused to believe this and took proceedings against him, but as all the servants told the same story, the prefect was unable to convict him. Chu returned home and took counsel with the judge, who told him there would be no difficulty, it being merely necessary to make the murdered girl herself speak. That night Mr. Wu dreamt that his daughter came and said to him, I was killed by Yang Tianen of Su Chi. Mr. Wu had nothing to do with it, but desiring a better-looking face for his wife, Judge Lu gave him mine, and thus my body is dead while my head still lives. Bear Chu no malice. When he awaked, he told his wife, who had dreamt the same dream, and thereupon he communicated these facts to the officials. Subsequently, a man of that name was captured, who confessed under the bamboo that he had committed the crime. So Mr. Wu went off to Chu's house and asked to be allowed to see his wife, regarding Chu from that time as his son-in-law. Mrs. Chu's old head was fitted onto the young lady's body, and the two parts were buried together.
Subsequent to these events, Mr. Chu tried three times for his doctor's degree, but each time without success, and at last he gave up the idea of entering into official life. Then, when thirty years had passed away, Judge Liu appeared to him one night and said, My friend, you cannot live forever. Your hour will come in five days' time. Chu asked the judge if he could not save him, to which he replied, The decrees of heaven cannot be altered to suit the purposes of mortals. Besides, to an intelligent man, life and death are much the same. Why necessarily regard life as a boon and death as a misfortune? Chu could make no reply to this, and forthwith proceeded to order his coffin and shroud, and then, dressing himself in his grave clothes, yielded up the ghost. Next day, as his wife was weeping over his beer, in he walked at the front door to her very great alarm. I am now a disembodied spirit, said Chu to her, though not different from what I was in life, and I have been thinking much of the widow and orphan I left behind. His wife, hearing this, wept till the tears ran down her face, Chu all the time doing his best to comfort her. I have heard tell, said she, of dead bodies returning to life, and since your vital spark is not extinct, why does it not resume the flesh? The ordinances of heaven, replied her husband, may not be disobeyed. His wife here asked him what he was doing in the infernal regions, and he said that Judge Lu had got him an appointment as registrar, with a certain rank attached, and that he was not at all uncomfortable. Mrs. Chu was proceeding to inquire further when he interrupted her, saying, The judge has come with me. Get some wine ready and something to eat. He then hurried out, and his wife did as he had told her, hearing them laughing and drinking in the guest chamber, just like old times come back again. About midnight she peeped in, and found that they had both disappeared, but they came back once in every two or three days, often spending the night and managing the family affairs as usual. Chu's son was named Wai, and was about five years old, and whenever his father came he would take the little boy upon his knee. When he was about eight years of age, Chu began to teach him to read, and the boy was so clever that by the time he was nine he could actually compose. At fifteen he took his bachelor's degree without knowing all this time that he had no father. From that date Chu's visits became less frequent, occurring not more than once or so in a month, until one night he told his wife that they were never to meet again. In reply to her inquiry as to whither he was going, he said he had been appointed to a far-off post where press of business and distance would combine to prevent him from visiting them any more. The mother and son clung to him, sobbing bitterly, but he said, Do not act thus. The boy is now a man, and can look after your affairs. The dearest friends must part some day. Then, turning to his son, he added, Be an honorable man, and take care of the property. Ten years hence we shall meet again. With this he bade them farewell, and went away. Later on, when Y was twenty-five years of age, he took his doctor's degree, and was appointed to conduct the sacrifices at the imperial tombs. On his way thither he fell in with a retinue of an official, proceeding along with all the proper insignia, and looking carefully at the individual sitting in the carriage, he was astonished to find that it was his own father. Alighting from his horse, he prostrated himself with tears at the side of the road, whereupon his father stopped and said, You are well spoken of. I now take leave of this world. Why remained on the ground, not daring to rise, and his father urging on his carriage, hurried away without saying any more. But when he had gone a short distance, he looked back and, unloosing a sword from his waist, sent it as a present to his son, shouting out to him, Wear this, and you will succeed. Why tried to follow him, but in an instant carriage, retinue, and horses had vanished with the speed of wind. For a long time, his son gave himself up to grief, and then, seizing the sword, began to examine it closely. It was of exquisite workmanship, and on the blade was engraved this legend. Be bold but cautious, round in discipline, square in action. Why subsequently rose to high honors, 
and had five sons named Chen, Qian, Wu, Hun, and Shen. One night he dreamt that his father told him to give the sword to Hun, which he accordingly did, and Hun rose to be a viceroy of great administrative ability. Footnotes 1. Literary Designation Every Chinese man and woman inherits a family name or surname. A woman takes her husband's surname, followed in official documents by her maiden name. Children usually have a pet name given to them soon after birth, which is dropped after a few years. Then there is the Ming, or name, which once given is unchangeable, and by which the various members of a family are distinguished. But only the emperor, a man's father and mother, and certain other relatives are allowed to use this. Friends call each other by their literary designations or book names, which are given generally by the teacher to whom the boy's education is first entrusted. Brothers and sisters and others have all kinds of nicknames, as with us. Dogs and cats are called by such names as Blackie, Whitey, Yellowy, Jewel, Pearly, etc., etc. Junks are christened Large Profits, Abounding Wealth, Favorite of Fortune, etc., etc. Places are often named after some striking geographical feature, e.g. Han Kao, Mouth of the Han River, i.e. its point of junction with the Yangtze, or they have fancy names such as Fukien, Happily Established, Tianxin, Heaven's Ford, or names implying a special distinction such as Nanking, Southern Capital, Shantung, East of the Mountains, etc. 2. Chamber of Horrors The name given by foreigners in China to the imitation of the ten torture chambers of purgatory as seen in every Cheng Huang or municipal temple. The various figures of the devil lictors and the tortured sinners are made either of clay or wood and painted in very bright colors, and in each chamber is depicted some specimen of the horrible tortures that wicked people will undergo in the world to come. I have given in the appendix a translation of the Yu Li Chao, a celebrated Taoist work on the subject, which should at any rate be glanced at by persons who would understand the drift of some of these stories. 3. Lighted a fire. To heat the wine, which is almost invariably taken hot. 4. They drank out of each other's cups, in token of their mutual good feeling. 5. I am only providing you with a more intelligent heart. The Chinese as a nation believe to this day that the heart is the seat of the intellect and emotions. 6. The proper orifice being stuffed up. The heart itself is supposed to be pierced by a number of eyes, which pass right through, and in physical and mental health these passages are believed to be clear. 7. I have now provided you with a better one, which I procured from Hades. The disembodied spirits of the Chinese inferno are permitted under certain conditions of time and good conduct to appropriate to themselves the vitality of some human being who, as it were, exchanges places with the so-called devil. 8. Take care not to wake the fowls or dogs. The Si Wan Lu, a well-known work on Chinese medical jurisprudence and an officially authorized book, while giving an absurd antidote against a poison that never existed, gravely insists that it is to be prepared at certain dates only, in some place quite far away from women, fowls, and dogs. 9. Though nineteen years of age had not yet been married, two gentlemen who were engaged to her having died before the day. It was almost a wonder that she got a second fiancé, few people caring to affiance their sons in a family where such a catastrophe has once occurred. The death of an engaged girl is a matter of much less importance, but is productive of a very curious ceremony. Her betrothed goes to the house where she is lying dead and steps over the coffin containing her body, returning home with a pair of the girl's shoes. He thus severs all connection with her, and her spirit cannot haunt him as it otherwise most certainly would do. 10. The Feast of Lanterns Held annually on the 15th of the first Chinese month, i.e. at the first full moon of the year, when colored lanterns are hung at every door. It was originally a ceremonial worship in the Temple of the First Cause, and dates from about the time of the Han Dynasty, or nearly two thousand years ago.
11, life and death are much the same. It was John Stuart Mill who pointed out that the fear of death is due to the illusion of imagination, which makes one conceive oneself as if one were alive and feeling oneself dead, the utility of religion. 12. Grave clothes. Boards of old age and clothes of old age sold here are common shop signs in every Chinese city, death and burial being always, if possible, spoken of euphemistically in some such terms as these. A dutiful son provides, when he can afford it, decent coffins for his father and mother. They are generally stored in the house, sometimes in a neighboring temple, and the old people take pleasure in seeing that their funeral obsequies are properly provided for, though the subject is never raised in conversation. Chinese coffins are beautifully made, and when the body has been in for a day or two, a candle is closely applied to the seams all around to make sure it is airtight. Any crack, however fine, being easily detected by the flickering of the flame in the escaping gas. Thus bodies may be kept unburied for a long time until the geomancer has selected an auspicious site for the grave. 13. Proceeding along with all the proper insignia. Gongs, red umbrellas, men carrying boards on which the officers' titles are inscribed in large characters, a huge wooden fan, etc., etc., 14. Be bold but cautious, round in disposition, square in action. Be like a cash is a not uncommon saying among the Chinese, the explanation of which rests upon the fact that a cash is round in shape and convenient for use, which words are pronounced identically with a corresponding number of words, meaning round in disposition, square in action. It is, in fact, a play on words. End of Judge Lou. Part 15 of A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling, translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Volume 1, Part 15, Miss Ying Ning or The Laughing Girl. At Lo Tien, in the province of Shantung, there lived a youth named Wang Tzu Fu, who had been left an orphan when quite young. He was a clever boy, and took his bachelor's degree at the age of fourteen, being quite his mother's pet, and not allowed by her to stray far away from home. One young lady, to whom he had been betrothed, having unhappily died, he was still in search of a wife when, on the occasion of the Feast of Lanterns, his cousin Wu asked him to come along for a stroll. But they had hardly got beyond the village before one of his uncle's servants caught them up and told Wu he was wanted. The latter accordingly went back, but Wang, seeing plenty of nice girls about and being in high spirits himself, proceeded on alone. Amongst others he noticed a young lady with her maid. She had just picked a sprig of plum blossom, and was the prettiest girl he had ever heard of, her smiling face being very captivating. He stared and stared at her quite regardless of appearances, and when she had passed by she said to her maid, "'That young fellow has a wicked look in his eyes.' As she was walking away, laughing and talking, the flower dropped out of her hand, and Wang, picking it up, stood there disconsolate as if he had lost his wits. He then went home in a very melancholy mood, and, putting the flower under his pillow, lay down to sleep. He would neither talk nor eat, and his mother became very anxious about him, and called in the aid of the priests. By degrees he fell off in flesh, and got very thin and the doctor felt his pulse and gave him medicines to bring out the disease. Occasionally he seemed bewildered in his mind, but in spite of all his mother's inquiries, would give no clue as to the cause of his malady. One day when his cousin Wu came to the house, Wang's mother told him to try and find out what was the matter, and the former, approaching the bed, gradually and quietly led up to the point in question. Wang, who had wept bitterly at the sight of his cousin, now repeated to him the whole story, begging him to lend some assistance in the matter. "'How foolish you are, cousin!' cried Wu. 
there will be no difficulty at all. I'll make inquiries for you. The girl herself can't belong to a very aristocratic family to be walking alone in the country. If she's not already engaged, I have no doubt we can arrange the affair, and even if she is unwilling, an extra outlay will easily bring her round. You make haste and get well. I'll see to it all. Wang's features relaxed when he heard these words, and Wu left him to tell his mother how the case stood, immediately setting on foot inquiries as to the whereabouts of the girl. All his efforts, however, proved fruitless, to the great disappointment of Wang's mother, for since his cousin's visit, Wang's color and appetite had returned. In a few days Wu called again, and in answer to Wang's questions, falsely told him the affair was settled. "'Who do you think the young lady is?' said he. "'Why, a cousin of ours, who is only waiting to be betrothed. And though you two are a little near, I dare say this difficulty may be overcome.' Wang was overjoyed, and asked where she lived, so Wu had to tell another lie and say, On the southwest hills about ten miles from here. Wang begged him again and again to do his best for him, and Wu undertook to get the betrothal satisfactorily arranged. He then took leave of his cousin, who from this moment was rapidly restored to health. Wang drew the flower from underneath his pillow, and found that, though dried up, the leaves had not fallen away. He often sat playing with this flower and thinking of the young lady. But by and by, as Wu did not reappear, he wrote a letter and asked him to come. Wu pleaded other engagements, being unwilling to go, at which Wang got into a rage and quite lost his good spirits, so that his mother, fearing a relapse, proposed to him a speedy betrothal in another quarter. Wang shook his head at this, and sat day after day waiting for Wu, until his patience was thoroughly exhausted. He then reflected that ten miles was no great distance, and that there was no particular reason for asking anybody's aid, so, concealing the flower in his sleeve, he went off in a huff by himself without letting it be known. Having no opportunity of asking the way, he made straight for the hills, and after about ten miles walking, found himself right in the midst of them, enjoying their exquisite verdure, but meeting no one, and with nothing better than mountain paths to guide him away down in the valley below, almost buried under a densely luxuriant growth of trees and flowers, he espied a small hamlet, and began to descend the hill and make his way thither. He found very few houses, and all built of rushes, but otherwise pleasant enough to look at. Before the door of one, which stood at the northern end of the village, were a number of graceful willow trees, and inside the wall plenty of peach and apricot trees, with tufts of bamboo between them, and birds chirping on the branches. As it was a private house he did not venture to go in, but sat down to rest himself on a huge smooth stone opposite the front door. By and by he heard a girl's voice from within, calling out Pasayo Jung, and noticing that it was a sweet-toned voice, set himself to listen, when a young lady passed with a bunch of apricot flowers in her hand, which she was sticking into her bent-down head. As soon as she raised her face she saw Wang, and stopped putting in the flowers. Then, smothering a laugh, she gathered them together and ran in. Wang perceived to his intense delight that she was none other than his heroine of the Feast of Lanterns, but recollecting that he had no right to follow her in, was on the point of calling after her as his cousin. There was no one, however, in the street, and he was afraid lest he might have made a mistake. Neither was there anybody at the door of whom he could make inquiries so he remained there in a very restless state until the sun was well down in the west, and his hopes were almost at an end, forgetting all about food and drink. He then saw the young lady peep through the door, apparently very much astonished to find him still there, and in a few minutes out came an old woman leaning on a stick, who said to him, "'Whence do you come, sir? I hear you have been here ever since morning. What is it you want? Aren't you hungry?' Wang got up, and making a bow, replied that he was in search of some relatives of his, but the old woman was deaf and didn't catch what he said, so he had to shout it out again at the top of his voice. She asked him what their names were, but he was unable to tell her, at which she laughed and said, It is a funny thing to look for people when you don't know their names. I am afraid you are an unpractical gentleman. You had better come in and have something to eat. We'll give you a bed, and you can go back tomorrow and find out the names of the people you are in quest of. 
Now Wang was just beginning to get hungry, and, besides, this would bring him nearer to the young lady, so he readily accepted and followed the old woman in. They walked along a paved path banked on both sides with hibiscus, the leaves of which were scattered about on the ground, and passing through another door, entered a courtyard full of trained creepers and other flowers. The old woman showed Wang into a small room with beautifully white walls, and a branch of a crab tree coming through the window, the furniture being also nice and clean. They had hardly sat down when it was clear that someone was taking a peep through the window, whereupon the old woman cried out, Hsiao Zheng, make haste and get dinner. And a maid from outside immediately answered, Yes, ma'am. Meanwhile, Wang had been explaining who he was, and then the old lady said, Was your maternal grandfather named Wu? He was, replied Wang. Well, I never, cried the old woman. He was my uncle, and your mother and I are cousins. But in consequence of our poverty and having no sons, we have kept quite to ourselves, and you have grown to be a man without my knowing you. I came here, said Wang, about my cousin, but in the hurry I forgot your name. My name is Chin, replied the old lady. I have no son, only a girl, the child of a concubine, who, after my husband's death, married again and left her daughter with me. She's a clever girl, but has had very little education, full of fun and ignorant of the sorrows of life. I'll send for her by and by to make your acquaintance. The maid then brought in the dinner, a well-grown fowl, and the old woman pressed him to eat. When they had finished and the things were taken away, the old woman said, Call Miss Ning, and the maid went off to do so. After some time there was a giggling at the door, and the old woman cried out, Ying Ning, your cousin is here. There was then a great tittering as the maid pushed her in, stopping her mouth all the time to try and keep from laughing. Don't you know better than to behave like that? asked the old woman. And before a stranger, too. So Ying Ning controlled her feelings, and Wang made her a bow, the old woman saying, Mr. Wang is your cousin. You have never seen him before. Isn't that funny? Wang asked how old his cousin was, but the old woman didn't hear him, and he had to say it again, which sent Ying Ning off into another fit of laughter. I told you, observed the old woman. She hasn't much education. Now you see it. She is sixteen years old, and as foolish as a baby. One year younger than I am, remarked Wang. Oh, you're seventeen, are you? Then you were born in the year such and such, under the sign of the horse. Wang nodded assent, and then the old woman asked who his wife was, to which Wang replied that he had none. What? A clever, handsome young fellow of seventeen not yet engaged? Ying Ning is not engaged either. You two would make a nice pair if it weren't for the relationship. Wang said nothing but looked hard at his cousin, and just then the maid whispered to her, It is the fellow with the wicked eyes. He's at his old game. Ying Ning laughed and proposed to the maid that they should go and see if the peaches were in blossom or not, and off they went together, the former with her sleeve stuffed into her mouth until she got outside, where she burst into a hearty fit of laughing. The old woman gave orders for a bed to be got ready for Wang, saying to him, It is not often we meet. You must spend a few days with us now you are here, and then we'll send you home. If you are at all dull, there is a garden behind where you can amuse yourself, and books for you to read. So next day Wang strolled into the garden, which was of moderate size, with a well-kept lawn and plenty of trees and flowers. There was also an arbor consisting of three posts with a thatched roof, quite shut in on all sides by the luxuriant vegetation. Pushing his way among the flowers, Wang heard a noise from one of the trees, and looking up saw Ying Ning, who at once burst out laughing and nearly fell down. "'Don't, don't!' cried Wang. "'You'll fall!' Then Ying Ning came down, giggling all the time, until, when she was near the ground, she missed her hold and tumbled down with a run. This stopped her merriment, and Wang picked her up, gently squeezing her hand as he did so. Ying Ning began laughing again, and was obliged to lean against a tree for support, it being some time before she was able to stop. Wang waited till she had finished, and then drew the flower out of his sleeve and handed it to her. "'It's dead,' said she. "'Why do you keep it?' "'You dropped it, cousin, at the Feast of Lanterns,' replied Wang, "'and so I kept it.' She then asked him what was his object in keeping it, to which he answered, "'To show my love, and that I have not forgotten you.' 
since that day when we met i have been very ill from thinking so much of you and am quite changed from what i was but now that it is my unexpected good fortune to meet you i pray you have pity on me you need not make such a fuss about a trifle replied she and with your own relatives too i'll give orders to supply you with a whole basketful of flowers when you go away wang told her she did not understand and when she asked what it was she didn't understand he said i didn't care for the flower itself it was the person who picked the flower of course answered she everybody cares for their relations you need not have told me that i wasn't talking about ordinary relations said wang but about husbands and wives what's the difference asked ying ning why replied wang husband and wife are always together just what i shouldn't like cried she to be always with anybody at this juncture up came the maid and wang slipped quietly away by and by they all met again in the house and the old woman asked ying ning where they had been whereupon she said they had been talking in the garden dinner has been ready a long time i can't think what you have had to say all this while grumbled the old woman my cousin answered ying ning has been talking to me about husbands and wives wang was much disconcerted and made a sign for her to be quiet so she smiled and said no more and the old woman luckily did not catch her words and asked her to repeat them wang immediately put her off with something else and whispered to ying ning that she had done very wrong the latter did not see that and when wang told her that what he had said was private answered him that she had no secrets from her old mother besides said she what harm can there be in talking on such a common topic as husbands and wives wang was angry with her for being so dull but there was no help for it and by the time dinner was over he found some of his mother's servants had come in search of him bringing a couple of donkeys with them it appeared that his mother alarmed at his non-appearance had made strict search for him in the village and when unable to discover any traces of him had gone off to the wu family to consult there her nephew who recollected what he had previously said to young wang advised that a search should be instituted in the direction of the hills and accordingly the servants had been to all the villages on the way until they had at length recognized him as he was coming out of the door wang went in and told the old woman begging that he might be allowed to take ying ning with him i have had the idea in my head for several days replied the old woman overjoyed but i am a feeble old thing myself and couldn't travel so far if however you will take charge of my girl and introduce her to her aunt i shall be very pleased so she called ying ning who came up laughing as usual whereupon the old woman rebuked her saying what makes you always laugh so you would be a very good girl but for that silly habit now here's your cousin who wants to take you away with him make haste and pack up the servants who had come for wang were then provided with refreshment and the old woman bade them both farewell telling ying ning that her aunt was quite well enough off to maintain her and that she had better not come back she also advised her not to neglect her studies and to be very attentive to her elders adding that she might ask her aunt to provide her with a good husband wang and ying ning then took their leave and when they reached the brow of the hill they looked back and could just discern the old woman leaning against the door and gazing towards the north on arriving at wang's home his mother seeing a nice-looking young girl with him asked in astonishment who she might be and wang at once told her the whole story but that was all an invention of your cousin wu's cried his mother i haven't got a sister and consequently i can't have such a niece ying ning here observed i am not the daughter of the old woman my father was named chin and died when i was a little baby so that i can't remember anything i had a sister said wang's mother who actually did marry a mr chin but she died many years ago and can't be still living of course however on inquiring as to facial appearance and characteristic marks wang's mother was obliged to acknowledge the identity wondering at the same time how her sister could be alive when she had died many years before just then in came Wu, and Ying Ning retired within, and when he heard the story, remained some time lost in astonishment, and then said, Is this young lady's name Ying Ning? Wang replied that it was, and asked Wu how he came to know it. Mr. Chin, answered he, after his wife's death, was bewitched by a fox, 
and subsequently died. The fox had a daughter named Ying Ning, and was well known to all the family, and when Mr. Chin died, as the fox still frequented the place, the Taoist Pope was called in to exercise it. The fox then went away, taking Ying Ning with it, and now here she is. While they were thus discussing, peals of laughter were heard coming from within, and Mrs. Wang took occasion to remark what a foolish girl she was. Wu begged to be introduced, and Mrs. Wang went in to fetch her, finding her in an uncontrollable fit of laughter, which she subdued only with great difficulty, and by turning her face to the wall. By and by she went out, but after making a bow, ran back and burst out laughing again, to the great amusement of all the ladies. Wu then said he would go and find out for them all about Ying Ning and her queer story, so as to be able to arrange the marriage. But when he reached the spot indicated, village and houses had all vanished, and nothing was to be seen except hill-flowers scattered about here and there. He recollected that Mrs. Chin had been buried at no great distance from that spot, he found, however, that the grave had disappeared, and he was no longer able to determine its position. Not knowing what to make of it all, he returned home, and then Mrs. Wang, who thought the girl must be a disembodied spirit, went in and told her what Wu had said. Ying Ning showed no signs of alarm at this remark, neither did she cry at all when Mrs. Wang began to condole with her on no longer having a home. She only laughed in her usual silly way, and fairly puzzled them all. Sharing Miss Wang's room, she now began to take her part in the duties of a daughter of the family, and as for needlework, they had rarely seen anything like hers for fineness. But she could not get over that trick of laughing, which, by the way, never interfered with her good looks, and consequently rather amused people than otherwise, amongst others a young married lady who lived next door. Wang's mother fixed an auspicious day for the wedding, but still feeling suspicious about Ying Ning, was always secretly watching her. Finding, however, that she had a proper shadow, she had her dressed up when the day came in all the finery of a bride, and would have made her perform the usual ceremonies, only Ying Ning laughed so much she was unable to kneel down. They were accordingly obliged to excuse her, but Wang began to fear that such a foolish girl would never be able to keep the family council. Luckily she was very reticent and did not indulge in gossip, and moreover, when Mrs. Wang was in trouble or out of temper, Ying Ning could always bring her around with a laugh. The maid servants too, if they expected a whipping for anything, would always ask her to be present when they appeared before their mistress, and thus they often escaped punishment. Ying Ning had a perfect passion for flowers. She got all she could out of her relations, and even secretly pawned her jewels to buy rare specimens, and by the end of a few months the whole place was one mass of flowers. Behind the house there was one especial tree which belonged to the neighbors on that side, but Ying Ning was always climbing up and picking the flowers to stick in her hair, for which Mrs. Wang rebuked her severely, though without any result. One day the owner saw her, and gazed at her some time in rapt astonishment. However, she didn't move, deigning only to laugh. The gentleman was much smitten with her, and when she smilingly descended the wall on her own side, pointing all the time with her finger to a spot hard by, he thought she was making an assignation. So he presented himself at nightfall, at the same place, and sure enough Ying Ning was there. Seizing her hand, to tell his passion, he found that he was grasping only a log of wood which stood against the wall, and the next thing he knew was that a scorpion had stung him violently on the finger. There was an end of his romance, except that he died of the wound during the night, and his family at once commenced an action against Wang for having a witch wife. The magistrate happened to be a great admirer of Wang's talent, and knew him to be an accomplished scholar. He therefore refused to grant the summons, and ordered the prosecutor to be bambooed for false accusation. Wang interposed and got him off his punishment, and returned home himself. His mother then scolded Ying Ning well, saying, I knew your too playful disposition would some day bring sorrow upon you but for our intelligent magistrate we should have been in a nice mess. Any ordinary hawk-like official would have had you publicly interrogated in court, and then how could your husband ever have held up his head again? Ying Ning looked grave and swore she would laugh no more, and Mrs. Wang continued, There's no harm in laughing as long as it is seasonable laughter. But from that moment Ying Ning laughed no more, no matter what people did to make her, 
though at the same time her expression was by no means gloomy. One evening she went in tears to her husband, who wanted to know what was the matter. I couldn't tell you before, said she, sobbing. We had known each other such a short time, but now that you and your mother have been so kind to me, I will keep nothing from you, but will tell you all. I am the daughter of a fox. When my mother went away, she put me in the charge of the disembodied spirit of an old woman, with whom I remained for a period of over ten years. I have no brothers, only you to whom I can look. And now my foster mother is lying on the hillside with no one to bury her, and appease her discontented shade. If not too much, I would ask you to do this, that her spirit may be at rest, and know that it was not neglected by her whom she brought up. Wang consented, but said he feared they would not be able to find her grave, on which Ying Ning said there was no danger of that, and accordingly they set forth together. When they arrived, Ying Ning pointed out the tomb in a lonely spot amidst a thicket of brambles, and there they found the old woman's bones. Ying Ning wept bitterly, and then they proceeded to carry her remains home with them, subsequently interring them in the Chin family vault. That night Wang dreamt that the old woman came to thank him, and when he waked he told Ying Ning, who said that she had seen her also, and had been warned by her not to frighten Mr. Wang. Her husband asked why she had not detained the old lady, but Ying Ning replied, She is a disembodied spirit, and would be ill at ease for any time surrounded by so much life. Wang then inquired after his Sao Jung, and his wife said, She was a fox too, and a very clever one. My foster mother kept her to wait on me, and she was always getting fruit and cakes for me, so that I have a friendship for her, and shall never forget her. My foster mother told me yesterday she was married. After this, whenever the great fast day came around, husband and wife went off without fail to worship at the Chin family tomb, and by the time a year had passed she gave birth to a son, who wasn't a bit afraid of strangers, but laughed at everybody, and in fact took very much after his mother. Footnotes 1. Called in the aid of the priests. Sickness being supposed to result from evil influence, witchcraft, etc., just as often as from more natural causes. 2. An extra outlay will easily bring her round. The rule which guides betrothals in China is that the doors should be opposite, i.e., that the families of the bride and bridegroom should be of equal position on the social scale. Any unpleasantness about the value of the marriage presents, and so on, is thereby avoided. 3. Though you two are a little near. Marriage between persons of the same surname, except in special cases, is forbidden by law, for such are held to be blood relations, descended lineally from the same original couple of that name. Inasmuch, however, as the line of descent is traced through the male branches only, a man may marry his cousins on the maternal side without let or hindrance except that of sentiment, which is sufficiently strong to keep these alliances down to a minimum. 4. The child of a concubine, who after my husband's death married again. A very unjustifiable proceeding in Chinese eyes, unless driven to it by actual poverty. 5. Under the sign of the horse. The Chinese years are distinguished by the names of twelve animals, namely rat, ox, tiger, hare, dragon, serpent, horse, sheep, monkey, cock, dog, and boar. To the common question, what is your honorable age, the reply is frequently, I was born under the whatever, and the hearer by a short mental calculation can tell at once how old the speaker is, granting of course the impossibility of making an error of so much as twelve years. 6. A clever, handsome young fellow of seventeen not yet engaged. Parents in China like to get their sons married as early as possible, in the hope of seeing themselves surrounded by grandsons, and the family name in no danger of extinction. Girls are generally married at from fifteen to seventeen. 7. Why, replied Wang, husband and wife are always together. Just what I shouldn't like, cried she, to be always with anybody. This scene should forever disabuse people of the notion that there is no such thing as making love among the Chinese. That the passion is just as much a disease in China as it is with us will be abundantly evident from several subsequent stories, though by those who have lived and mixed with the Chinese people no such confirmation will be needed. I have even heard it gravely asserted by an educated native that not a few of his countrymen had died for love of the beautiful Miss Lin, 
the charming but fictitious heroine of the so-called dream of the red chamber playgoers can here hardly fail to notice a very striking similarity to the close of the first act of sir w s gilbert's sweethearts eight gazing towards the north looking sorrowfully after them nine taoist pope the semi-divine head of the taoist religion wrongly called the master of heaven in his body is supposed to reside the soul of a celebrated taoist an ancestor of his who actually discovered the elixir of life and became an immortal some eighteen hundred years ago at death the precious soul above mentioned will take up its abode in the body of some youthful member of the family to be hereinafter revealed meantime the present pope makes a very respectable income from the sale of charms by working miracles and so forth and only about eighteen seventy seven he visited shanghai where he was interviewed by several foreigners ten finding however that she had a proper shadow disembodied spirits are supposed to have no shadow and but very little appetite there are also certain occasions on which they cannot stand the smell of sulphur fisk in his myths and myth makers page two hundred thirty says almost universally ghosts however impervious to thrust of sword or shot of pistol can eat or drink like squire westerns eleven ying ning laughed so much he was unable to kneel down the all-important item of a chinese marriage ceremony amounting in fact to calling god to witness the contract twelve one especial tree the mu siang or rosa bank Sae. thirteen the magistrate refused to grant the summons and ordered the prosecutor to be bambooed for false accusation strictly in accordance with chinese criminal law fourteen she is a disembodied spirit and would be ill at ease for any time surrounded by so much life these disembodied spirits are unable to stand for any length of time the light and life of this upper world darkness and death being as it were necessary to their existence and comfort fifteen the great fast day the day before the annual spring festival end of miss ying ning or the laughing girl Part sixteen of selection from strange stories from a Chinese studio, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A selection from strange stories from a Chinese studio, by Pu Songling, translated by herbert allen giles volume one part sixteen the magic sword read by vivian chen march two thousand eight in guangzhou china ning chai chen was a zhijiang man and a good-natured honorable fellow fond of telling people that he had only loved once happening to go to Jinghua, he took shelter in a temple to the north of the city very nice as far as ornamentation went but overgrown with grass taller than a man's head and evidently not so much frequented on either side were the priest's apartments the doors of which were ajar with the exception of a small room on the south side where the lock had a new appearance in the east corner he espied a group of bamboos growing over a large pool of water lilies in flower and being much pleased with the quiet of the place determined to remain more specially as the grand examiner being in the town all lodges had gone up in price so he roamed about waiting till the priest should return and in the evening a gentleman came and opened the door on the south side ning quickly met up to him and with a bow informed him of his desire there is no one here whose permission you need to ask replied the stranger i am only lodging here and if you don't object to the loneliness i shall be very pleased to have the benefit of your society ning was delighted and made himself a strawberry and put out a board for table 
as if he intended to remain some time and that night by the beams of the clear bright moon they sat together in the veranda and talked the stranger's name was yin chi xia and ning thought he was a student up for the probing soul examination only his dialect was not that of a zhijiang man on being asked he said he came from shen si and there was an air of straightforwardness about all his remarks by and by when their conversation was exhausted they bade each other good night and went to bed but ning being in a strange place was quite unable to sleep and soon he heard sounds of voices from the room on the north side getting up he peeped through a window and saw in a small couch at the other side of a low wall a woman of about forty with an old maid servant in a long faded gown hump-backed and feeble-looking they were chatting by the light of the moon and the mistress said why doesn't xiao qing come she ought to be here by now replied the other she isn't offended with you is she asked the lady not that i know of answered the old servant but she seems to want you to get trouble such person don't deserve to be treated well said the other and she had hardly uttered this word when up came a young girl of seventeen or eighteen and very nice looking the old servant laughed and said ah don't talk of people behind their backs we were just mentioning you as you come without our hearing you but fortunately we were saying nothing bad about you and as far as that goes it is she yes i am a young fellow why i should certainly fall in love with you you don't praise me replied the girl i'm sure i don't know who will and then the lady and the girl said something together and mr nim thinking they were the family next door turned around to sleep without paying further attention to them in a little while no sound was to be heard but as he was dropping off to sleep he perceived that somebody was in the room jumping up in great haste he found it was the young lady he had just seen and detecting at once that she was going to attempt to bewitch him sternly bade her be gone she then produced a lump of gold which he threw away and told her to go after it or he would call his friend so she had no alternative but to go muttering something about his heart being like iron or stone next day a young candidate for the examination came and lodged in the east room with his servant he however was killed that very night and his servant the night after the causes of both showing a small hole in the sole of the foot as you bought by a hole and from which little blood came no one knew who had committed this murders and when mr yin came home ning asked him what he thought about it yin replied that it was the work of evils but ning was a brave fellow and that didn't frighten him much in the middle of the night xiao qian appeared to him again and said i have seen many men but none with a still cold heart like yours you are an outright man and i will not attempt to deceive you i xiao qian whose family name is nie died when only eighteen and was buried alongside of this temple a devil then took possession of me and employed me to bewitch people by my beauty contrary to my inclination there is now nothing left in this temple to slot and i fear that ifs will be employed to kill you ning was very frightened at this and asked her what he should do sleep in the same room with mr yen replied she what asked yen cannot the spirit trouble yen 
he is a strange man she answered and they didn't like going near him ning then inquired how the spirits worked i bewitched people said xiao qian and then they bore a hole in the food which renders the victim senseless and proceed to draw the blood which the devils drink another method is to tempt people by false gold the bones of some horrid demon and if they receive it their hearts and livers will be torn out if the method is used according to the circumstances ning thanked her and asked when he ought to be prepared to which she replied tomorrow night at the parting she wept and said i am about to sink into the great sea with no friendly saw at hand but your sense of duty is boundless and you can save me if you will collect my bones and bury them in some quiet spot i shall not again be subject to these misfortunes ning said he would do so and asked where she lay buried at the foot of the aspen tree on which there is a bird's nest replied she and passing out of the door disappeared the next day ning was afraid that yen might be going away somewhere and went over early to invite him across wine and food were produced towards noon and ning whom took care not to lose sight of yen then asked yen to remain there for the night yen declaimed on the ground that he liked being by himself but ning wouldn't hear any excuses and carried all yen's things to his own room so that he had no alternative but to consent however he warned ning saying i know you are a gentleman and a man of honour if you see anything you don't quite understand i pray you not to be too inquisitive do not pray into my boxes or it might be the worse for both of us ning promised to attempt to what he said and by and by they most lie down to sleep and yen having placed his boxes on the window sill was soon snoring loudly ning himself could not sleep and after some time he saw a figure moving stealthily outside at length approaching the window to peep through its eyes flashed like lightning and ning in a terrible fright was just upon the point of calling yen when something flew out of the bosses like a string of white silk and dashing against the window sill returned at once to the box disappearing very much like lightning yen heard the noise and got up ning all the time pretend to be asleep in order to watch what happened the former then opened the box and took out something which he smelled and examined by the light of the moon it was dazzlingly white like crystal and about two inches in length by the width of an onion leaf in breadth he then wept it carefully and put it back in the broken box saying a bull-faced devil there to dare thus to break my box upon which he went back to bed but ning who was lost in astonishment arose and asked him what it all meant telling at the same time what himself had seen as you and i are good friends replied yen i won't make any secret of it the fact is i am a Taoist priest but for the window sill the devil would have been killed as it is he is badly wounded ning asked him what it was he had there whipped at and he told him it was his sword on which he had spelled the presence of the devil at ning's request he produced the weapon a bright little miniature of a sword and from that time ning held his friend in higher esteem than ever next day he found traces of blood outside the window which led around to the north of the temple and there among a number of graves he discovered the aspen tree with the bird's nest at its summit he then fulfilled his promise and prepared to go home yen giving him a farewell banquet 
in presenting him with an old leather case which he said contained a sword and would keep a distance from him all diabolos and bogies ning then wished to learn a little of yin's art but the latter replied that although he might accomplish this easily enough being as he was an outright man yet he was well off in life and not in a condition where it would be of any advantage to him ning then pretending that he had a younger sister buried here dug up xiu qian's bones and having wrapped them up in grave clothes hired a boat and set out on his way home on his arrival as his library looked towards the open country he made a grave harbour and buried the bones there sacrificing and invoking xiao qian as follows in pity for your lonely ghost i have placed your remains near my humble cottage where we shall be near each other and no devil would dare annoy you i pray you reject not my sacrifice poor though it be after this he was proceeding home when he suddenly heard himself addressed from behind the voice asking him not to hurry and turning around he beheld xiao qian who thanked him saying were i to die ten times for you i could not discharge my debt let me go home with you and wait upon your father and mother you will not repent it looking closely at her he observed that she had a beautiful complexion and feet as small as bamboo shoes being altogether much prettier now that he came to see her by daylight so they went together to his home and bade her to wait a while then ran into to tell his mother to the very great surprise of the old lady now ning's wife had been ill for a long time and his mother advised him not to say a word about it to her for fear of frightening her in the middle of which in rush xiao qian and threw herself on the ground before them this is the young lady said ning whereupon his mother in some alarm turned her attention to xiao qian who cried out a lonely orphan without brother or sister the object of your son's kindness and compassion best to be allowed to give her poor services as some return for the favors shown Ni's mother seeing that she was a nice pleasant-looking girl began to lose fear of her and replied madam the preference you show for my son is highly pleasant to an old body like myself but this is the only hope of our family and i heartily dare agree to his taking a double wife oh i have but one motive in what i ask answered xiao qian and if you have no faith in disembodied people then let me regard him as my brother and live under your protection serving you like a daughter ning's mother could not resist her straightforward manner and xiao qian asked to be allowed to see ning's wife but this was denied on the plea that the lady was ill xiao qian then went to the kitchen and got ready the dinner running about the place as if she had lived there all her life ning's mother was however much afraid of her and would not let her sleep in the house so xiao qian went to the library and was just entering when suddenly she fell back a few steps and began to walking hurriedly back forth and forwards in front of the door ning seeing this called out and asked her what it meant to which she replied the pleasance of that sort frightens me and that's why i could not accompany you on your way home ning at once understood her and hang out the sword case in another place whereupon she entered lighted a candle and sat down for some time she did not speak at length asking ning if he started at night or not for said she when i was little i used to repeat the leng yin zhe but now i have forgotten more than half and therefore i should like to borrow a copy and when you are at leisure in the evening you might hear me ning said he would and they sat 
silently there for some time after which xiao qing went away and took up her quarters elsewhere morning and night she waited on Ning's mother bringing water for her to wash in occupying herself with household matters and endeavouring to please her in every way in the evening before she went to bed she would always go in and repeat a little of the straw and leave as soon as she thought ning was getting sleepy now the illness of ning's wife had given his mother a great deal of extra trouble more in fact than she was equal to but ever since xiao qian's arrival all this was changed and ning's mother felt kindly disposed to the girl in consequence gradually growing to regard her almost as her old child and forgetting quite that she was a spirit accordingly she didn't make her leave the house at night and xiao qian whom being a devil had not tasted meat or drink since her arrival now began at the end of six months to take a little thin grow mother and son alike become very fond of her and henceforth never mentioned what she really was neither were strangers able to detect the fact by and by ning's wife died and his mother secretly wished him to espouse xiao qian though she rather dreaded any unfortunate consequences that might arise this xiao qian perceived and seizing an opportunity said to ning's mother i have been with you for more than a year and you ought to know something of my disposition because i was unwilling to injure chaperus i followed your son hither there was no other motive and as your son had shown himself one of the best of men i would now remain with him for three years in order that he may obtain for me some mark of imperial approbation which will do me honour in the rhymes below Ning's mother knew that she meant no evil, but hesitated to put the family's hopes of posterity into jeopardy. Xiao Qian, however, reassured her by saying that Ning would have three sons, and that I would not be interrupted by his marrying her. On the strength of this, the marriage was arranged to the great joy of Ning, a feast prepared, and friends and relatives invited and when in response to a call the bride herself came forth in her gay wedding dress the beholders took her rather for fairy than for evil after this numerous of congratulatory presents were given by the various female members of the family who vied with one another in making her acquaintance and this xiao qian returned by gifts of plantings of flowers done by herself in which she was very skilful the receivers being extremely proud of such marks of her friendship one day she was leaning at the window in a despondent mood when suddenly she asked where the sockets was oh replied ning as you seemed afraid of it i moved you elsewhere i have now been so long under the influence of surrounding life said xiao qian that i should not be afraid of it any more less hung it on the bed why so asked ning for the last three days explained she i have been much agitated in mind and i am free that that devil at the temple angry at my escape may come suddenly and carry me off so ning brought the sword case and xiao qian after examining it closely remarked ah uh, this is where the magician puts people i wondered how many were slain before it gets old and worn out as it is now even now when i look at it my flesh creeps the case was then hung up and next day removed to over the door at night they sat down and watched xiao qian warning ning not to go to sleep and suddenly something fat down flopped like a bird xiao qian in a fright got behind the curtain but ning would take the thing 
and found it was the epoch darkness with glaring eyes and a bloody mouth coming straight to the door stealthily creeping up it made a grab at the suitcase and seemed about to tear it in pieces when bam the suitcase became as big as a warzor and from it a devil protruded part of its body and dragged the imp in nothing more was heard and the suitcase resumed its original size ning was greatly alarmed monsieur chien came out rejoicing and said ah that's an end of my troubles in the suitcase they found only a few quarts of clear water nothing else after this immense ning took his daughter's degree and xiao chien bought him a sum he then took a concubine and had one more sum by each all of whom became in time distinguished men footnotes one he told him it was his sword every Taoist priest has a magic sword corresponding to our magician's wand two bamboo suits which were cut are a very good substitute for asparagus three being a devil had not tasted me or drink since her arrival disembodied spirits are supposed to have no shadow and have but very little appetite four some are called imperial approbation such as are from time to time bestowed upon virtuous widows and wives filial sons and daughters and others this consists of some laudatory skull or tablet and are much prized by the family of the recipient five i had not been so long under the influence of surrounding life these disembodied spirits are unable to stand for any length of time the light and life of the upper world darkness and death being as it were necessary to their existence and comfort end of the magic sword part 17 of a selection from strange stories from a chinese studio volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling, translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Volume 1, Part 17, The Shui Mang Plant. The Shui Mang is a poisonous herb. It is a creeper, like the bean, and has a similar red flower. Those who eat of it die and become shui mang devils, tradition asserting that such devils are unable to be born again unless they can find someone else who has also eaten of this poison to take their place. These shui mang devils abound in the province of Hunan, where, by the way, the phrase same year man is applied to those born in the same year who exchange visits and call each other brother their children addressing the father's brother as uncle. This has now become a regular custom there. A young man named Chu was on his way to visit a same-year friend of his when he was overtaken by a violent thirst. Suddenly he came upon an old woman sitting by the roadside under a shed and distributing tea gratis, and immediately walked up to her to get a drink. She invited him into the shed and presented him with a bowl of tea in a very cordial spirit, but the smell of it did not seem like the smell of ordinary tea, and he would not drink it, rising up to go away. The old woman stopped him and called out, San Niang, bring some good tea. Immediately a young girl came from behind the shed, carrying in her hands a pot of tea. She was about fourteen or fifteen years old, and of very fascinating appearance, with glittering rings and bracelets on her fingers and arms. As Chu received the cup from her, his reason fled, and drinking down the tea she gave him, the flavor of which was unlike any other kind, he proceeded to ask for more. Then, watching for a moment when the old woman's back was turned, he seized her wrist and drew a ring from her finger. The girl blushed and smiled, and Chu, more and more inflamed, 
asked her where she lived. Come again this evening, replied she, and you'll find me here. Chu begged for a handful of her tea, which he stowed away with the ring and took his leave. Arriving at his destination, he felt a pain in his heart, which he at once attributed to the tea, telling his friend what had occurred. Alas, you are undone, cried the other. They were Shui Mang devils. My father died the same way, and we were unable to save him. There is no help for you. Chu was terribly frightened, and produced the handful of tea, which his friend at once pronounced to be the leaves of the Shui Mang plant. He then showed him the ring, and told him what the girl had said, whereupon his friend, after some reflection, said, She must be Sang Niang, of the Ku family. How could you know her name? asked Chu, hearing his friend use the same words as the old woman. Oh, replied he, there was a nice-looking girl of that name who died some years ago from eating of the same herb. She is doubtless the girl you saw. Here someone observed that if the person so entrapped by a devil only knew its name, and could procure an old pair of its shoes, he might save himself by boiling them in water and drinking the liquor as medicine. Chu's friend thereupon rushed off at once to the Ku family, and implored them to give him an old pair of their daughter's shoes. But they, not wishing to prevent their daughter from finding a substitute in Chu, flatly refused his request. So he went back in anger and told Chu, who ground his teeth with rage, saying, If I die, she shall not obtain her transmigration thereby. His friend then sent him home, and just as he reached the door, he fell down dead. Chu's mother wept bitterly over his corpse, which was in due course interred, and he left behind one little boy barely a year old. His wife did not remain a widow, but in six months married again and went away, putting Chu's son under the care of his grandmother, who was quite unequal to any toil and did nothing but weep morning and night. One day she was carrying her grandson about in her arms, crying bitterly all the time, when suddenly in walked Chu. His mother, much alarmed, brushed away her tears and asked him what it meant. Mother, replied he, down in the realms below I heard you weeping. I am therefore come to tend you. Although a departed spirit, I have a wife who has likewise come to share your toil. Therefore do not grieve. His mother inquired who his wife was, to which he replied, When the Ku family sat still and left me to my fate, I was greatly incensed against them and after death I sought for San Niang, not knowing where she was. I have recently seen my old same-year friend, and he told me where she was. She had come to life again in the person of the baby daughter of a high official named Jen, but I went thither and dragged her spirit back. She is now my wife, and we get on extremely well together. A very pretty and well-dressed young lady here entered, and made obeisance to Chu's mother, Chu saying, this is San Niang of the Ku family. And although not a living being, Mrs. Chu at once took a great fancy to her. Chu sent her off to help in the work of the house, and, in spite of not being accustomed to this sort of thing, she was so obedient to her mother-in-law as to excite the compassion of all. The two then took up their quarters in Chu's old apartments, and there they continued to remain. Meanwhile, San Niang asked Chu's mother to let the Ku family know and this she did, notwithstanding some objections raised by her son. Mr. and Mrs. Ku were much astonished at the news, and, ordering their carriage, proceeded at once to Chu's house. There they found their daughter, and parents and child fell into each other's arms. San Niang entreated them to dry their tears, but her mother, noticing the poverty of Chu's household, was unable to restrain her feelings. We are already spirits, cried San Niang, what matters poverty to us? Besides, I am very well treated here, and am altogether as happy as I can be. They then asked her who the old woman was, to which she replied, Her name was Ni. Nee. She was mortified at being too ugly to entrap people herself, and got me to assist her. She has now been born again at a soy shop in the city. Then, looking at her husband, she added, Come, since you are the son-in-law, pay the proper respect to my father and mother, or what shall I think of you? Chu made his obeisance, and San Niang went into the kitchen to get food ready for them, at which her mother became very melancholy, and went away home, whence she sent a couple of maid servants, a hundred ounces of silver, and rolls of cloth and silk, 
besides making occasional presents of food and wine, so that Chu's mother lived in comparative comfort. San Niang also went from time to time to see her parents, but would never stay very long, pleading that she was wanted at home, and such excuses, and if the old people attempted to keep her, she simply went off by herself. Her father built a nice house for Chu with all kinds of luxuries in it, but Chu never once entered his father-in-law's door. Subsequently, a man of the village who had eaten Shui Mang, and had died in consequence, came back to life to the great astonishment of everybody. However, Chu explained it, saying, I brought him back to life. He was the victim of a man named Li Chu, but I drove off Li's spirit when it came to make the other take his place. Chu's mother then asked her son why he did not get a substitute for himself, to which he replied, I do not like to do this. I am anxious to put an end to, rather than take advantage of, such a system. Besides, I am very happy waiting on you, and have no wish to be born again. From that time all persons who had poisoned themselves with Shui Mang were in the habit of feasting Chu and obtaining his assistance in their trouble. But in ten years' time his mother died, and he and his wife gave themselves up to sorrow and would see no one, bidding their little boy put on mourning, beat his breast, and perform the proper ceremonies. Two years after Chu had buried his mother, his son married the granddaughter of a high official named Jen. This gentleman had had a daughter by a concubine who had died when only a few months old, and now, hearing the strange story of Chu's wife, he came to call on her and arrange the marriage. He then gave his granddaughter to Chu's son, and a free intercourse was maintained between the two families. However, one day Chu said to his son, Because I have been of service to my generation, God has appointed me keeper of the dragons, and I am now about to proceed to my post. Thereupon four horses appeared in the courtyard, drawing a carriage with yellow hangings, the flanks of the horses being covered with scale-like trappings. Husband and wife came forth in full dress, and took their seats, and, while son and daughter-in-law were weeping their adieus, disappeared from view. That very day the Ku family saw their daughter arrive, and, bidding them farewell, she told them the same story. The old people would have kept her, but she said, My husband is already on his way, and, leaving the house, parted from them forever. Chu's son was named Ngo, and his literary name was Li Chen. He begged San Yang's bones from the Ku family, and buried them by the side of his father's. Footnotes 1. Shui Mang, probably the Elysium Religiosum, S and Z, is meant. 2. Such devils are unable to be born again unless they can find someone else who has also eaten of this poison to take their place. The disembodied spirits of the Chinese Inferno are permitted, under certain conditions of time and good conduct, to appropriate to themselves the vitality of some human being, who, as it were, exchanges places with the so-called devil. 3. In the province of Hunan, the phrase same-year man is applied to those born in the same year. The common application of the term same-year men is to persons who have graduated at the same time. 4. Distributing tea gratis. This is by no means an uncommon form of charity. During the temporary distress at Canton in the summer of 1877, large tubs of gruel were to be seen standing at convenient points, ready for any poor person who might wish to stay his hunger. It is thus, and by similar acts of benevolence, such as building bridges, repairing roads, etc., etc., that the wealthy Chinaman strives to maintain an advantageous balance in his record of good and evil. End of The Shui Mang Plant Part 18 of a selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Shongling, translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Volume 1, Part 18, Little Zhu. A man named Li Hua dwelt at Changzhou. He was very well off and about 50 years of age, but he had no sons, only one daughter named Xiao Hui, a pretty child 
on whom her parents doted. When she was fourteen, she had a severe illness and died, leaving their home desolate and depriving them of their chief pleasure in life. Mr. Li then bought a concubine, and she, by and by, bore him a son who was perfectly idolized, and called Zhu, or the Pearl. This boy grew up to be a fine, manly fellow, though so extremely stupid that, when five or six years old, he didn't know pulse from corn, and could hardly talk plainly. His father, however, loved him dearly and did not observe his faults. Now it chanced that a one-eyed priest came to collect alms in the town, and he seemed to know so much about everybody's private affairs that the people all look upon him as superhuman. He himself declared he had control over life, death, happiness, and misfortune. And consequently, no one dared refuse him whatever sum he chose to ask of them. From Li, he demanded one hundred ounces of silver, but was offered only ten, which he refused to receive. This sum was increased to thirty ounces. Whereupon the priest looked sternly at Li and said, "I must have one hundred, not a fraction less." Li now got angry and went away without giving him any. The priest too, rising up in a rage and shouting after him, "I hope you won't repent." Shortly after this event, little Zhu fell sick, and crawled about the bed, scratching the mat. His face being of an ashen paleness, this frightened his father. Who hurried off with eighty ounces of silver and begged the priest to accept them? A large sum like this is no trifling matter to earn," said the priest, smiling. "But what can a poor recruit like myself do for you?" So Li went home to find that little Zhu was already dead, and this worked him into such a state that he immediately. Laid a complaint before the magistrate. The priest was accordingly summoned and interrogated, but the magistrate wouldn't accept his defense and ordered him to be bambooed. The blows sounded as if falling on leather. Upon which the magistrate commanded his lictor to search him, and from about his person they drew forth two wooden men, a small coffin, and five small flags. The magistrate here flew into a passion and made certain mystic signs with his fingers, which, when the priest saw, he was frightened, and began to excuse himself. But the magistrate would not listen to him, and had him bambooed to death. Li thanked him for his kindness and, taking his leave, proceeded home. In the evening, after dusk. He was sitting alone with his wife when suddenly in popped a little boy, who said, "Pa, why did you hurry on so fast? I couldn't catch you up." Looking at him more closely, they saw that he was about seven or eight years old, and Mr. Li, in some alarm, was on the point of questioning him, when he disappeared, reappearing again like smoke. And curling round and round, got upon the bed. Li pushed him off, and he fell down without making any sound, crying out, "Pa, why do you do this?" And in a moment he was on the bed again. Li was frightened, and ran away with his wife. The boy calling after them, "Pa, ma, boo woo!" They went into the next room, bolting the door after them. But there was a little boy at their heels again. Li asked him what he wanted, to which he replied, "I belong to Suzhou. My name is Zhan. At six years of age, I was left an orphan. My brother and his wife couldn't bear me, so they sent me to live at my maternal grandfather's. One day, when playing outside, a wicked priest killed me." By his black art, underneath a mulberry tree, 
and made of me an evil spirit, dooming me to everlasting devildom without hope of transmigration. Happily, you expose him, and I would now remain with you as your son. The paths of men and devils, replied Li, lie in different directions. How can we remain together? Give me only a tiny room, cried the boy, a bed, a mattress, and a cup of cold gruel every day. I ask for nothing more. So Li agreed. To the great delight of the boy, who slept by himself in another part of the house, coming in the morning and walking in and out like any ordinary person, hearing Li's concubine crying bitterly, he asked how long little Zhu had been dead, and she told him seven days. It's cold weather now, said he, and the body can't have decomposed. Have the grave open. And let me see it. If not too far gone, I can bring him to life again. Li was only too pleased and went off with the boy. And when they opened the grave, they found the body in perfect preservation. But while Li was controlling his emotions, lo, the boy had vanished from his sight. Wondering very much at this, he took little Zhu's body home. And had hardly laid it on the bed, when he noticed the eyes moved. Little Zhu then called for some broth, which put him into a perspiration. And then he got up. They were all overjoyed to see him come to life again. And what is more, he was much brighter and cleverer than before. At night, however, he lay perfectly stiff and rigid. Without showing any sign of life, as he didn't move when they turned him over and over, they were much frightened, and thought he had died again. But toward daybreak, he awaked as if from a dream, and in reply to their questions, said that when he was with the wicked priest, there was another boy named Guzi, and that the day before. When he had been unable to catch up his father, it was because he had stayed behind to bid adieu to Guzi that Guzi was now the son of an official in purgatory named Jiang, and very comfortably settled, and that he had invited him Zhan to go and play with him that evening, and had sent him back on a white-nosed horse. His mother then asked him. If he had seen Little Zhu in purgatory, to which he replied, "Little Zhu has already been born again. He and our father here had not really the destiny of father and son. Little Zhu was merely a man named Yan Zifang from Jinling, who had come to reclaim an old debt. Now Mr. Li had formerly traded to Jinling, and actually owed money for goods." To a Mister Yan, but he had died, and no one else knew anything about it, so that he was now greatly alarmed when he heard this story. His mother next asked the quasi little Zhu if he had seen his sister Xiao Hui, and he said he had not, promising to go again and inquire about her. A few days afterwards, he told his mother that Xiao Hui was very happy in purgatory. Being married to a son of one of the judges, and that she had any quantity of jewels, and crowds of attendants when she went abroad, why doesn't she come home to see her parents? Asked his mother. Well, replied the boy, dead people, you know, haven't got any flesh or bones. However, if you can only remind them of something that happened in their past lives. Their feelings are at once touched. So yesterday I managed through Mister Jiang to get an interview with Xiao Hui, and we sat together on a coral couch, and I spoke to her of her father and mother at home, all of which she listened to as if she was asleep. I then remarked, "Sister, when you were alive, you were very fond of embroidering double-stemmed flowers." 
and once you cut your finger with the scissors, and the blood ran over the silk, but you brought it into the picture as a crimson cloud. Your mother has that picture still, hanging at the head of her bed, a perpetual souvenir of you, sister. Have you forgotten this? Then she burst into tears, and promised to ask her husband to let her come and visit you. His mother asked when she would arrive, but he said he could not tell. However, one day he ran in and cried out, "Mother, Xiao Hui has come, with a splendid equipage and a train of servants. We had better get plenty of wine ready." In a few moments, he came in again, saying, "Here is my sister." At the same time, asking her to take a seat and rest, he then wept. But none of those present saw anything at all. By and by, he went out and burned a quantity of paper money and made offerings of wine outside the door. Returning shortly and saying he had sent away her attendants for a while, also that Xiao Hui asked if the green coverlet. A small portion of which had been burnt by a candle was still in existence. It is," replied her mother. And going to a box, she at once produced the coverlet. Xiao Hui would like a bed made up for her in her old room," said her crazy brother. "She wants to rest a while, and will talk with you again in the morning." Now their next door neighbor named Zhao had a daughter who was formerly a great friend. Of Xiao Hui's, and that night, she dreamt that Xiao Hui appeared with a turban on her head, and a red mantle over her shoulders, and that they talked and laughed together precisely as in days gone by. I am now a spirit," said Xiao Hui, "and my father and mother can no more see me than if I was far separated from them. Dear sister, I will borrow your body." From which to speak to them, you need fear nothing. On the morrow, when Miss Zhao met her mother, she fell on the ground before her and remained some time in a state of unconsciousness. At length, saying, "Madame, it is many years since we met. Your hair has become very white." The girl's mad," said her mother, in alarm, and thinking something had gone wrong. Proceeded to follow her out of the door. Miss Zhao went straight to Li's house, and there, with tears, embraced Mrs. Li, who did not know what to make of it all. Yesterday, said Miss Zhao, when I came back, I was unhappily unable to speak with you, unfilial wretch that I was, to die before you and leave you to mourn my loss. How can I redeem such behavior? Her mother thereupon began to understand the scene, and weeping said to her, "I have heard that you hold an honorable position, and this is a great comfort to me. But living as you do in the palace of a judge, how is it you are able to get away?" My husband replied, "She is very kind." And his parents treat me with all possible consideration. I experience no harsh treatment at their hands. Here, Miss Zhao rested her cheek upon her hand, exactly as Xiao Hui had been wont to do when she was alive. And at that moment, in came her brother to say that her attendants were ready to return. I must go," said she. Rising up and weeping bitterly all the time, after which she fell down and remained some time unconscious as before. Shortly after this event, Mister Li became dangerously ill, and no medicines were of any avail. So that his son feared they would not be able to save his life. Two devils sat at the head of his bed. One holding an iron staff, the other a nettle hemp rope, four or five feet in length. Day and night, his son implored them to go, but they would not move. And Mrs. Li, in sorrow, began to prepare the funeral clothes. 
Toward evening, her son entered and cried out, "Strangers and women, leave the room! My sister's husband is coming to see his father-in-law." He then clapped his hands and burst out laughing. "What is the matter?" asked his mother. "I am laughing," answered he, "because when the two devils heard my sister's husband was coming, they both ran under the bed, like." Terrapins, drawing in their heads. By and by, looking at nothing, he began to talk about the weather and asked his sister's husband how he did. And then he clapped his hands and said, "I begged the two devils to go, but they would not. It's all right now." After this, he went out to the door and returned, saying, "My sister's husband has gone." He took away the two devils tied to his horse. My father ought to get better now. Besides, Xiao Hui's husband said he would speak to the judge, and obtain a hundred years' lease of life, both for you and my father. The whole family rejoiced exceedingly at this. And when night came, Mister Li was better, and in a few days quite well again. A tutor was engaged for the quasi little Zhu, who showed himself an apt pupil, and at eighteen years of age took his bachelor's degree. He could also see things of the other world, and when anyone in the village was ill, he pointed out where the devils were, and burned them out with fire, so that everybody got well. However, before long, he himself. Became very ill, and his flesh turned green and purple. Whereupon he said, "The devils afflict me thus because I let out their secret. Henceforth, I shall never divulge them again." Footnotes: One, in reply to their question, said that when he was with the wicked priest, there was another boy named Ge Zi. It may be necessary here to remind the readers that Zhang spirits is speaking from Zhu's body. Two, little Zhu was merely a man named Yan Zifang from Jinling, who had come to reclaim an old debt. We shall come by and by to a story illustrative of this extraordinary belief. Three. She had any quantity of jewels, the sumo bunum of many a Chinese woman. Four burned a quantity of paper money, Chinese silver, called sai si, from the Cantonese sai si, fine silk, because if pure, it may be drawn out under the application of heat into fine silk threads. Is cast in the form of shoes, weighing from one to one hundred ounces. Paper imitations of this are burnt for the use of the spirits in the world below. The sharp edges of a shoe of sai si are caused by the mold containing the molten silver being gently shaken until the metal has set, with a view to secure uniform fineness throughout the lump. Five. Mrs. Li, in sorrow, began to prepare the funeral clothes. Death is regarded as a summons from the authority of purgatory. Lictors are sent to arrest the doomed man armed with a written warrant, similar to those issued on earth from a magistrate's yamen. End of little jewel. Part Nineteen of a Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio by Pu Song Ling, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, Volume One, Part Nineteen, Miss Quarta Hu. Mr. Shang was a native of Taishan and lived quietly with his books alone. 
one autumn night when the silver river was unusually distinct and the moon shining brightly in the sky he was walking up and down under the shade with his thoughts wandering somewhat at random when lo a young girl leaped over the wall and smiling asked him what are you thinking about sir all so deeply shang looked at her and seeing that she had a pretty face asked her to walk in she then told him her name was who and that she was called tertia but when he wanted to know where she lived she laughed and would not say so he did not inquire any further and by degrees they struck up a friendship and Miss Tertia used to come and chat with him every evening. He was so smitten that he could hardly take his eyes off her, and at last she said to him, What are you looking at? At you, cried he, my lovely rose, my beautiful peach. I could gaze at you all night long. If you think so much of poor me, answered she, I don't know where your wits would be if you saw my sister Porta. Mr. Shang said he was sorry he didn't know her, and begged that he might be introduced. So next night Miss Tertia brought her sister, who turned out to be a young damsel of about fifteen, with a face delicately powdered and resembling the lily, or like an apricot flower seen through mist, and altogether as pretty a girl as he had ever seen. Mr. Shang was charmed with her, and inviting them in, began to laugh and talk with the elder, while Miss Corta sat playing with her girdle, and keeping her eyes on the ground. By and by Miss Tertia got up and said she was going, whereupon her sister rose to take leave also. But Mr. Shang asked her not to be in a hurry, and requested the elder to assist in persuading her. "'You needn't hurry,' said she to Miss Corta, and accordingly the latter remained chatting with Mr. Shang without reserve, and finally told him she was a fox. However, Mr. Shang was so occupied with her beauty that he didn't pay any heed to that. But she added, my sister is very dangerous. She has already killed three people. Anyone bewitched by her has no chance of escape. Happily, you have bestowed your affections on me, and I shall not allow you to be destroyed. You must break off your acquaintance with her at once. Mr. Shang was very frightened, and implored her to help him, to which she replied, Although a fox, I am skilled in the arts of immortals. I will write out a charm for you, which you must paste on the door, and thus you will keep her away. So she wrote down the charm, and in the morning when her sister came and saw it, she fell back, crying out, Ungrateful minx! You've thrown me up for him, have you? You two being destined for each other, what have I done that you should treat me thus? She then went away, and a few days afterwards Miss Corta said she too would have to be absent for a day, so Shang went out for a walk by himself, and suddenly beheld a very nice-looking young lady, emerge from the shade of an old oak that was growing on the hillside. "'Why so dreadfully pensive?' said she to him. "'Those who girls can never bring you a single cent.' She then presented Shang with some money, and bade him go on ahead and buy some good wine, adding, "'I'll bring something to eat with me, and we'll have a jolly time of it.' Shang took the money and went home, doing as the young lady had told him, and by and by in she herself came, and threw on the table a roast chicken and a shoulder of salt pork, which she at once proceeded to cut up. They now set to work to enjoy themselves, and had hardly finished when they heard someone coming in, and the next minute in walked Miss Tertia and her sister. The strange young lady didn't know where to hide, and managed to lose her shoes. But the other two began to revile her, saying, Out upon you, base fox, what are you doing here? They then chased her away after some trouble, and Shang began to excuse himself to them, until at last they all became friends again as before. One day, however, a Shensi man arrived, riding on a donkey, and coming to the door said, I have long been in search of these evil spirits, now I have got them. Shang's father thought the man's remark rather strange, and asked him whence he had come. Across much land and sea, replied he, for eight or nine months out of every year I am absent from my native place. These devils killed my brother with their poison, alas, alas, and I have sworn to exterminate them, but I have travelled many miles without being able to find them. They are now in your house, and if you do not cut them off, you will die even as my brother. Now Shang and the young ladies had kept their acquaintanceship very dark, but his father and mother had guessed that something was up, and, much alarmed, 
bade the Shensi man walk in and perform his exorcisms. The latter then produced two bottles which he placed upon the ground, and proceeded to mutter a number of charms and cabalistic formulae, whereupon four wreaths of smoke passed two by two into each bottle. I have the whole family, cried he, in an ecstasy of delight, and he proceeded to tie down the mouths of the bottles with a pig's bladder, sealing them with the utmost care. Shang's father was likewise very pleased, and kept his guest to dinner, but the young man himself was sadly dejected, and approaching the bottles unperceived, bent his ear to listen. Ungrateful man, said Miss Quarta from within, to sit there and make no effort to save me. This was more than Shang could stand, and he immediately broke the seal, but found that he could not untie the knot. Not so, cried Miss Quarta, merely lay down the flag that now stands on the altar, and with a pin prick the bladder, and I can get out. Shang did as she bade him, and in a moment a thin streak of white smoke issued forth from the hole and disappeared in the clouds. When the Shensi man came out and saw the flag lying on the ground, he started violently and cried out, Escaped! This must be your doing, young sir! He then shook the bottle and listened, finally exclaiming, Luckily only one has got away. She was fated not to die, and may therefore be pardoned. Thereupon he took the bottles and went his way. Some years afterwards, Shang was one day superintending his reapers cutting the corn, when he descried Miss Corta at a distance, sitting under a tree. He approached, and she took his hand, saying, Ten years have rolled away since we last met. Since then I have gained the prize of immortality. But I thought that perhaps you had not quite forgotten me, and so I came to see you once more. Shang wished her to return home with him, to which she replied, I am no longer what I was that I should mingle in the affairs of mortals. We shall meet again. And as she said this, she disappeared. But twenty years later, when Shang was one day alone, Miss Quarta walked in. Shang was overjoyed and began to address her, but she answered him, saying, My name is already enrolled in the register of the immortals, and I have no right to return to earth. However, out of gratitude to you, I have determined to announce to you the date of your dissolution, that you might put your affairs in order. Fear nothing, I will see you safely through to the happy land. She then departed, and on the day named, Shang actually died. A relative of a friend of mine, Mr. Li Wen Yu, frequently met the above-mentioned Mr. Shang. Footnotes 1. Silver River the Milky Way is known to the Chinese under this name, unquestionably a more poetical one than our own. 2. Her name was Hu. Hu is the sound of the character for fox. It is also the sound of quite a different character, which is used as a surname. 3. The Immortals, that is, of the Taoists. 4. She was fated not to die and may therefore be pardoned. Predestination after the event is, luckily for China, the form of this superstition which really appeals to her all practical children. Not a larger percentage than with ourselves allow belief in an irremediable destiny to divert their efforts one moment from the object in view, though thousands upon thousands are ready enough to acknowledge the will of heaven in any national or individual calamities that may have befallen. 5. I have gained the prize of immortality. Any disembodied spirit whose conduct for a certain term of years is quite satisfactory is competent to obtain this reward. Thus, instead of being born again on earth, perhaps as an animal, they become angels or good spirits, and live forever in heaven in a state of supreme beatitude. 6. A relative of a friend of mine, Mr. Li Wen Yu, frequently met the above-mentioned Mr. Shang. Our author occasionally ends up with a remark of this kind and these have undoubtedly had their weight with his two credulous countrymen. End of Miss Quarta Hu Part 20 A Selection from Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. A selection from strange stories from Chinese studio. 
by Pu Song Ling, translated by Hervey Aaron Giles, Volume One, Part Twenty. Mister Zhu, the considerate husband. Read by Vivian Chen, March two thousand eight, in Guangzhou, China. At the village of Zhu in Qian, there was a man named Zhu who died at the age of fifty and odd years. His family at once proceeded to put on their mourning robes, when suddenly they heard the dead man cry out. Rushing out to the coffin, they found that he had come to life again, and began, full of joy, to ask him all about it. But the old gentleman replied only to his wife, saying, When I died, I did not expect to come back. However, by the time I had got a few miles on my way, I thought of the poor old body I was leaving behind me, dependent for everything on others, and with no more enjoyment of life. So I made up my mind to return and take you away with me. The bystanders thought this was only the disconnected talk of a man who had just regained consciousness and attached no importance to it but the old man repeated it and then his wife said it's all very well but you have only just come to life how can you go and die again directly it is extremely simple replied her husband you go and pack up everything ready the old lady laughed and did nothing upon which mr chu urged her again to prepare and then she left the house in a short time she returned and pretended that she had done what he wanted then you had better dress said he but mrs chu did not move until he pressed her again and again after which she didn't like to cross him, and by and by came out all fully equipped. The other ladies in the family were laughing on the sly. When Mr. Zhu laid his head upon the pillow and told his wife to do likewise, she was beginning to say, It is too ridiculous. When Mr. Zhu bent the back with his hand and cried out, was there to love back in dying upon which the various member of the family seeing the old gentleman was in a rage begged she to gratify his whim mrs drew then ran down alongside of her husband to the infinite amusement of the spectators but it was soon noticed that the old lady had ceased to smile and by and by her two eyes closed. For a long time, no sound was heard, as if she was fast asleep. And when some of those present approached to touch her, they found she was as cold as ice and no longer breathing. Then, turning to her husband, they perceived that he also had passed away. This story was full related to me by a younger sister-in-law of Mr. Jules, who in the twenty-first year of the reign, Kangxi, was employed in the house of high official named B. Footnote. The twenty-first year of the reign, Kangxi, was 1682 A.D. End of Mr. Zhu, the considerate husband. End of a selection.